Howdy my totally tubular gamers. And here we are with a ranking video, but not just any ranking video. Here we have a big ranking video, a really big ranking video. Today we are ranking every Capcom fighting game. Yes, I have played every single Capcom fighting game and I'm going to be ranking them all for you from worst to best. I'm going to be talking about every single one, giving them all a little review and seeing how they all stack up against each other. Now, before we begin, I wanna give a little context. I love fighting games. I've been playing fighting games pretty much my whole life. I've always had fun with fighting games, and I truly believe that even the very worst of fighting games, you can still have fun with them. Now, Capcom has always been the king of fighting games. In my opinion, no company has put out more fighting games than Capcom, or better fighting games than Capcom. Like, I really love just about all of the games I'm gonna talk about here. Now, one thing I want to bring up is I am not a fighting game aficionado. I'm not a pro. I don't know the competitive scene for all these games. I'm not a competitive person in that sense. I'm a pretty casual fighting game fan. You know, I'll play with my friends. I'll mess around. There's very few games I've even attempted to go pro with. Like, I play hundreds of games a year, no exaggeration, and so I don't know all the ins and outs of every fighting game. And so these aren't going to be really in-depth reviews, examining every single mechanic and seeing how they all stack up against each other. This is just my opinion. Now, this is like the biggest list that I've ever done on the channel, at least so far, and so I want to set a few ground rules. First off, we're going to be looking at all the games released in North America. If the game only came out in Japan, I'm not going to include it here. Thankfully, nearly every fighting game developed or published by Capcom has been released in North America in some capacity. Next, we are talking about Capcom fighting games. All of the games on this list have been either developed or published by Capcom. It's one of the two, and if it's not developed by Capcom, I will make it clear who did develop it. I am throwing in two exceptions, being the SNK versus Capcom games, because it just felt a little weird to leave them out. But those are the only two exceptions. We're not talking about every SNK game here. We're not talking about every game that Capcom has a part of. So we're not talking about like Smash Brothers because Ryu and Ken are in there. We aren't talking about fan games either. There's not going to be any Mugen or anything. We are talking about officially developed or published by Capcom and released in North America. The next thing to bring up is a lot, and I mean a lot of these games, particularly Street Fighter 2, have tons of versions. And so I'm going to be combining all of the versions into one entry. All of them are going to be just one entry and I'm going to be playing what is considered, I guess, the best version of them all. So, you know, Street Fighter 3, there might be three different versions of it, but we're just talking about Third Strike since Third Strike's the best one. We're also not talking about beat-em-ups, we're talking about fighting games. So games like Final Fight are not here outside of the Final Fight fighting game. We're also not talking about games with fighting game elements or maybe a side mode. Just because there's a side mode or there's some elements that you might find in a fighting game does not mean it's a fighting game. So sorry, Puzzle Fighter, you're not getting invited to this one. I'm also not including any collections on here since why would I include the collection? I'm actually talking about all the games here. So sorry, all the many Darkstalkers collections, you're not getting included. As usual, we're not talking about any mobile games. I just don't mess around with mobile games. Some of these games have mobile versions, which is cool, but we're not talking about mobile only titles. Now, I'm not a pro. I don't know everything. I am a human. I got most of my information from the Capcom Wiki and Wikipedia. But you know, if somehow I missed a game and it falls in the parameters I just mentioned, you let me know down below and I'll tell you where it would place in here and how I messed up. But I am pretty confident in my search, I think I've played every Capcom fighting game in the parameters that I specified. And so with all that, I'm sure you're wondering, how did this guy play all of these games and where did he get the time to play them and make this long ass video? Well, a number of these games I actually just own and can play on actual hardware and then the other ones I relegated to the emulators. Lots of emulation here and in terms of time, I recently got laid off from Insomniac Games and find myself with a lot of free time at the moment. And so what better way than to play a bunch of fighting games and talk about them? We're gonna be talking about 52 fighting games. Yes, 52, so strap in. This is gonna be a really long one. You know, get some food, get on a long ass car ride, make it two times speed if you gotta. We're talking about a lot of games here. So really, let's just get right into it. This intro has been long enough. Please like, share, share with anyone you know, anyone you like, anyone you dislike, your dog. Subscribe for more big ass lists. We got a Patreon going on. Let me know down below your favorite cap Capcom fighting games, any fun memories you have, or why you think I'm a dumbass and I'm wrong and I don't know anything, or whatever it is you want to tell me, let's get into it now. Out of all, and I mean all of Capcom's fighting games, what is the worst? What is the worst, weakest fighting game they've made? 
And here we have the original Street Fighter releasing all the way back in 87. You know, it really shouldn't be a shock that, like, Capcom's first fighting game would be their weakest. Now, the original Street Fighter had established a lot of things that would be very prevalent to the series, but if you come back in the modern day and try this game, you are going to have a hard time with it because this game has not aged well at all. You know, I get it. It was one of, like, the very first fighting games, and so I wouldn't have expected it to age all that well, but playing it nowadays is very, very rough. Don't get me wrong, it was innovative and it established a bunch of conventions that would become standard in later fighting games, like the use of command-based special moves or the six-button controls, but if you play this game nowadays, you'll immediately see what I'm talking about when I say that the game is rough. The biggest thing I'm going to bring up is the controls. This game is very, and I mean very, stiff. Like, really freaking stiff. This is like the stiffest fighting game I've ever played. And you know, I played like the original Fatal Fury games. Nope, this is even stiffer than that. Like, inputting any kind of command, just really doing any kind of attack, it is a chore. It is a hassle to do anything in this game. It is the opposite of fluid. It is a solid. Like, it is a solid pain in the ass to move in this game is what it is. And controlling this game is just not fun. Controlling Ryu, I will say, is you can only actually play as Ryu in the single player. If there's a second player, then you can actually play as Ken. But, yeah, it's either Ryu or Ken. They have some special moves, but it is just a pain in the ass to do anything in this game. And you basically have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one boss fights. That's really what it is. It's more of like a boss gauntlet than an actual fighting game. And, like... The damage meters are all over the place. You do a ton of damage with the special moves. Forget any regular moves. The special moves just destroy. And this game, you know, it's not messing around either. It's really difficult. And most of it is the controls as to why it's difficult. But the enemies, the bosses, really, they'll just whoop your ass also. And there's a bunch of characters here that would be iconic in later Street Fighter games. But it's cool to see where they all got their start here. And yeah, that's just kind of how I feel about the game, you know, it's cool to see where it got its start, but there is no reason, like, no reason you should play the original Street Fighter in the modern day. I mean, if you want to play a bad joke on somebody, you challenge them to Street Fighter 1 and SF6, but other than that, no. Do not play the original Street Fighter. It has just been obliterated by time. Its own series has even obliterated it. And so here we have Street Fighter the Movie the Game releasing for the Saturn and the PlayStation in 95. Now the 1994 live action Street Fighter movie it certainly is something. It's one of those, it's so bad, it's good movies. Like, it, it, it's just terrible. It's absolutely terrible in all the best ways and it's certainly worth a laugh. But, you know, they decided to make a video game tie-in for the movie that's a tie-in to the video game because that makes a lot of sense. And what we have here is not only one of the worst fighting games Capcom has ever made, but one of the worst Street Fighter games of them all. Honestly, this game just barely inches past that original Street Fighter, and that was one of the first fighting games ever made. This game, the only reason it's like any higher is just because it's kind of a shitpost and it's hilarious to see. Like, it looks like Mortal Kombat with the digitized images, and you know, Mortal Kombat, that was its style it looked a bit weird and hokey but that was Mortal Kombat style here it just looks really bad like it looks just terrible it does not fit Street Fighter it looks super hokey and just it just looks bad like it has terrible animation it doesn't flow nice it's not nice to look at it it really looks like shit now, not only does it look like shit, but it runs and plays like it as well. The game is constantly slowing down or lagging in some way, and any fighting game that is slow down, it's immediately going to just ruin the flow. As you're going to do inputs, nothing's going to happen. You're going to have to do it like three times just to get it to even come out, and it just doesn't make for a very fun experience. And thanks to this, it's one of the slowest fighting games I've ever seen, and not in a good way. Not like Samurai Showdown where it's slow and methodical. No, this, this is just bad. The actual gameplay tries to be closer to Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, but it just feels so bad that I just couldn't even really try to get into this. There's a decent amount of characters all based off the movie, and they use their movie counterparts, obviously, but it, I just couldn't even like get into this. There is the arcade version, which has the same name, Street Fighter the Movie, and this is a little better, but not so much better to the point where I'd make it its own entry or put it somewhere else on the list. Like, I'm just going to put the two versions together. They're both bad. At least the arcade version isn't constantly slowing down, but it still feels and looks like shit. And really, it just feels nothing like a Street Fighter game. In recent years, I think this game's had a little bit of a tournament resurgence because it's just kind of a shit post, which is hilarious, I won't lie. But in terms of actually talking and reviewing and ranking all of these games, no, this game is like near the bottom. It is not worth playing even as a shit post. Like just just avoid it. It's not good. 
And so here we have Capcom Fighting Evolution releasing in 2004. Now when this game came out, a lot of people immediately disliked it and said that it sucked. And over the years, a lot of people have gone on to say that this is one of the worst fighting games Capcom has ever made. And yeah, I can absolutely agree with that assessment. Capcom Fighting Evolution is one of the worst fighting games I've ever seen and one of the laziest fighting games I've ever seen as well. And I just don't really know what they were doing with this one. The game is just this weird mix of Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter Alpha 3, Third Strike, Darkstalkers 3, and then Red Earth of all games. Now when I say it puts them together, I'm not talking about in some cool crossover way, I'm talking it literally rips characters, mechanics, and even art styles from those respective games and puts them all together, and it isn't in some cohesive, unified way, it looks like Mugen, where it just literally, they just cut and paste these characters, how they play, how they look into these games, and it's inconsistent. What you have now is a bunch of different fighting styles with a bunch of different looking graphics because they literally just cut and paste everything in and it just kind of creates this Frankenstein monster. This game just doesn't have any cohesion or flow to it. It doesn't feel nice, it doesn't play nice, and it certainly doesn't look nice. This came out in like the mid 2000s. This didn't come out in like the mid to late 90s and they just cut and paste a bunch of stuff. They knew exactly what they were doing. Almost every other Capcom fighting game plays nicer than this game. The roster was super whack also. Like, what even is this roster? How are you missing Ken, Sagat, and then Morgan? You are missing Morgan. You have Dark Stalkers in this game, but you don't have, I don't know, like the main character basically, the icon of Dark Stalkers, Morgan. It's just a bad roster, and then the Red Earth inclusion, like just why? You know, with all the systems and characters and just crap going on with this game, I can't imagine it's well balanced either. All of this leads me to say, just don't even bother with this game. Do not bother with this game. It really is one of Capcom's worst, and it's just lazy and, and not worth trying. And so here we have Final Fight Revenge releasing for the arcades in 99. Now this game, if you somehow couldn't tell, is a Final Fight game. Shocking, I know, water is wet as well. And it's the only Final Fight fighting game actually, and strangely enough, it's a 3D fighting game. And what it does is it takes a bunch of Final Fight characters and has them all face off against each other. The roster itself is full of all the Final Fight classics and even some Street Fighter characters, but at this point, Street Fighter and Final Fight are so intertwined that they might as well all be Street Fighter characters. And then you can go through the arcade mode, or you can fight a friend, or enemy, or whoever sitting next to you who would want to play this. So the actual fighting, it's a very clunky, just kind of janky 3D fighting game from the 90s. It has not exactly aged the best. You have four attack buttons, two punches, two kicks, and a fifth special button. And that special button is just kind of almost like the 3D button where you can actually go into the four or background, or it can be used to pick up a weapon. Now the actual fighting in this game, it just doesn't feel nice. Like, it just does not feel nice. It feels stiff, it feels clunky, and I can't believe I'm saying it, I'd rather actually play Virtua Fighter than this. Does this feel better than like the 3D Samurai Showdown games? Yeah, I can say it feels better than those, but I still would not want to play this game. I just never got a hang of how this game felt or the flow or anything like that. And you know, I didn't sit here and dump a ton of time into it. I just was kind of done with it pretty quick. I was like, yep, this isn't very good and I really don't want to play it. And I haven't heard anybody really talk anything positive about this game. The first time I ever heard about this game actually was like an interview with Shinji Mikami, the director of the game God Hand. He said that this game was so disappointing. It was one of the reasons that he made God Hand. And yeah, God Hand's a lot better than this game. The game is just really clunky, it hasn't aged well presentation wise, it's not great, the music, music's alright. And I really just can't recommend anybody plays this game, whether you like Final Fight or Capcom or Street Fighter, it's just not worth playing, it's not really enjoyable. The game's not even really available either, you'd have to go out of your way to really play this game. It was only released in America in arcades, so you gotta, you know, break out the MAME. It was released for the Saturn in Japan, and you can't actually play the game in English but I really just don't think it's worth it here. The game is just a skip. And so here we have Heavy Metal Geomatrix releasing for the Dreamcast in 2001. This is one of the most bizarre games Capcom has ever made. Like it is not only incredibly experimental, but it's just really weird to see. So the game is a 3D arena fighter where you pick up guns and melee weapons and really just go at each other. It's very similar to the spawn fighting game by Capcom that we'll get to soon enough, but there are a few differences here, keeping it different from the spawn game. First off, the game's aesthetic, the presentation, the characters, 
obviously that's completely different it's just different from not only the spawn game but like any other capcom game so it's got original characters it's got a heavy metal theme and vibe around it and i mean that's cool it's really unique it's different this was years before guitar hero so the game is a 3D arena fighter where you pick up guns and melee weapons and really just go at each other. It's very similar to the spawn fighting game by Capcom that we'll get to soon enough. So that aesthetic hadn't really been seen much outside of I guess maybe like Kiss Psycho Circus, but even that was different. Anyway, with all of this in mind, how's the music? That's probably one of the first things you're going to think about this game. The music actually is pretty solid. The game actually is Megadeth, which is super cool. And the soundtrack is low-key the best part of this entire game. Not even low-key, it really just is the best part of this entire game. It's certainly not the gameplay. The gameplay in this game, it's a bit clunky, it takes some time to get used to, it's not the most intuitive, but what it really is is a 3D arena fighter where you're dropped into these rather large and open environments, especially compared to the spawn game. Really these open environments and you pick up guns and melee weapons and just try to kill each other. I'm not going to say it's the most in-depth or complex or even balanced, but it certainly is an arena fighter. You know, I've never been huge on arena fighters in this game. <laughs> I'm not huge on the gameplay here either. It takes a bit of time to get used to the controls and just how everything feels and even the camera perspective. And the core gameplay, it really just wasn't there for me. I just never had very much fun with this game when compared to the Spawn game. And then if you want to compare it to other 3D Capcom fighting games like Power Stone, oh... Power Stone wipes the floor with this game. This game, it's kind of forgotten for a reason. I'd say this game is really just more of a bizarre oddity at this point than, say, some hidden gem that's worth seeking. In a party setting, this game could be a lot more fun. It could actually be fun, but to do that, you know, you'd need friends. You'd, they'd actually want to have to play this game. You'd need a Dreamcast. And if you're going to go through all that energy just to play this game, I really suggest using that energy to play basically any other fighting game on the Dreamcast by Capcom. It's just really not worth playing nowadays. The music though, the music might be worth listening to if you like this genre. And here we have Red Earth releasing originally in 96, but it would not get a US release all the way until 2022 with the Capcom Fighting Collection. And you know, after all these years, is Red Earth actually worth playing? Well, in my opinion, probably not, which makes me sad. So Red Earth has a pretty unique setting. It's like an alternate version of Earth sometime in the 14th century. However, there was no technological revolutions or renaissance or anything, so the whole world just stayed in a medieval mythological state, and a new country is risen by this evil scion who sends out a ton of monsters to take over the Earth, and so four heroes emerge to defend said Earth. There's Leo, Kenji, Tessa, and then Mai Ling. Now, somewhere I can give this game praise is how the game looks aesthetically, the atmosphere, the vibes, and the characters. I think all of these are actually really well done. The game looks really cool. It looks different from other Capcom fighting games. These characters are cool, and the soundtrack is actually pretty decent. But then we have the actual gameplay, which is a bit different from most Capcom fighting games. The game still at its core is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, but this game introduces these different RPG elements. As you fight and as you defeat opponents, you'll actually gain experience and you can use it to improve your character's attack, defense, and access new moves. Now, not only was this pretty unique for the time, but even nowadays, I can't think of like any fighting games that have any kind of leveling up mechanics like this game does, and I mean, there might be a reason for that. I don't think it's the most well implemented, I don't think it really changes all that much, and it just kind of is there. And then we get to the fighting itself. The game is not exactly traditional when it comes to its fighting. Yes, if you do the versus mode, it is a bit more traditional. But in the arcade mode, really what it is is a series of boss fights. You fight a bunch of bosses here, and I'll be real, this game just does not actually feel very nice at all. Like, this is my biggest issue with the game. It just did not feel really good. Like, it was incredibly stiff, and there just wasn't really any strings or combos or anything past a couple basic combos. Maybe I just really suck and failed to understand this game, but it just felt incredibly clunky, and it was also pretty difficult. The bosses whooped my ass. And I just really wasn't having a great time with it. Like, it just really did not feel nice. I was like, gosh, and so many people said that this was like a hidden gem, and I... I actually don't really like it that much. Like, this came out when fighting games weren't this stiff. There were plenty of other fighting games by Capcom that came out in 96 that were not as stiff as this game. And it pains me that I don't have this game higher on the list. Like, I just don't like the controls. I don't like how it feels. It did not have a good flow. And it's a shame because this game has a bunch of other cool aspects. Not only is the presentation and the music cool, but the game actually has fatalities, which is pretty sick. It has multiple endings. 
it's got a unique premise like no this game should be one of capcom's coolest fighting games of all time yet here we are near the lower end of the list and i'm talking about it and that just it just pains me i really wanted to like red earth more than i did but i just could never really get behind the gameplay maybe this one's a hot take maybe it really is just me but that's my opinion on it let me know down below of course if you disagree and here we have Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite releasing in 2017. Now, I remember playing this game at E3, being like mildly excited, but then when it finally came out, I was pretty decently excited for it, played the game for a bit, and went, what the hell is this? And those levels of disappointment really have not left me. This game is easily one of the most disappointing games I've ever played from Capcom. Like, this game just kind of feels like a cash grab for the MVC license, or really the MCU in general. Something worth noting is that this game actually does have a story mode. It's like the only MVC with a story mode. It sees Ultron from Marvel teaming up with Sigma from Mega Man X becoming Ultron Sigma, and it's up to our heroes to stop him. I mean, decent enough little story that lasts a few hours, but it did not save this game. First off, I'm gonna just say my biggest complaint with this game is the roster. The roster is just absolutely gutted from MVC3 and especially Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Like, what even is this roster? It feels like just a big ad for the MCU. They only used MCU Marvel characters, so no X-Men, no Fantastic Four, no Doctor Doom. Like, a bunch of the fan favorites aren't here, and who we have instead are just characters I couldn't really care about. And the Capcom side, I don't know what happened, just some really strange omissions and some inclusions that just don't make much sense. I just remember going like, this roster, it sucks, like there's so many missing characters, like where are all the fan favorites and there's like almost no one new here either. In fact, the roster was way smaller than the previous two games to the point where it's not even 3 on 3 anymore, it's 2v2. And when it comes to the actual fighting mechanics, I mean, it's not the worst thing. The game actually feels alright, it's got some good combos, and it has a decent flow to it, but it doesn't feel anywhere near as good as the previous two games. And it just feels like a step back. It feels like a step back from those games, and really just most modern fighting games, and I just wasn't really having anywhere near as much fun with this game as I did with the others. And then they have the Infinity Stones, and you know... These aren't even really worth bringing up, like they're here, they can change stuff up, and it's kind of weird they brought them back from Marvel's superheroes, which was like not the throwback I don't think anyone was expecting, and there's a reason they never brought them back until now, like they didn't really work and weren't needed then, and they're still not needed now, MVC does not need this gimmick. The gimmick was Marvel and Capcom characters fighting each other, not these stupid stones, they just really don't add all that much, and they just feel completely unnecessary, I don't like them. And I'm pretty sure you can't use them in any kind of competitive mode, not that a competitive mode exists for this game, it was pretty much dead on arrival, people didn't play it when it came out, it had maybe a couple hundred players on Steam, which is where I bought it when it came out. And I doubt there's anyone playing it nowadays, and this game doesn't exactly have a ton of content, it mostly focused on the online, which is basically dead. Then don't even get me started on the presentation, everybody roasted it for how it looks, and yeah, it doesn't look good, the models look bad. And the game generally just looks out of date, like Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 looks better than this game in many aspects, and that game came out years before this one. Look, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, very disappointing and just not worth playing. I don't recommend anybody play this game. Even if you like Marvel vs. Capcom, just play the other ones. And so here we have SNK vs. Capcom The Match in the Millennium, releasing for the Neo Geo Pocket Color in 99. I played the Switch version that came out in 2021. Now this game was not developed or published by Capcom, but I know if I don't include it, some of y'all are gonna say, where's SNK vs. Capcom? So here we have it, we have the Neo Geo Pocket Color game, that's clearly what everyone wanted to see. But you know what, despite being on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, this game's actually pretty decent, you know? Obviously it is very simplified compared to really all the games on this list. But it's a fun little competent fighting game that might provide a tiny bit of fun for the curious bunch. So when it comes to the characters, the game actually has 26 different characters. And you know, it's a mix of King of Fighters, Fatal Fury, Darkstalkers, and of course the small little series Street Fighter that you may or may not have heard of. It's a decent little roster what we got here and everyone plays relatively different. So the game is a two on two tag fighter like MVC. It's just a lot and I mean a lot more basic. You know it actually controls decently well. It's not crazy stiff. It's not unplayable by any means and it's easy to understand what's going on here. You can do inputs like you would for some of these characters. There's less buttons than normal. 
but at least the game has an okay flow to it. I'm not going to say it's great. It is a bit sluggish and it can be clunky and a little awkward at times, but what you have here is a competent, small fighting game. Look, obviously it doesn't look or sound great. I mean, it was fine for the pocket color and it's not going to wow you with its presentation or controls or fighting or really any of that, but it is impressive for such a small handheld to be even half decent with a fighting game. And so with that in mind, I'm going to give the game some props. Is it something you should go out and play nowadays? No, it's definitely not that. But it could be so, so much worse. And what we have here, it's okay. Well, it's okay for the hardware it's on. When comparing all these fighting games together, yeah, it's not going to place particularly high. But, I mean, you could play a lot worse things or do a lot worse things with your life than try this. And here we have Onimusha Blade Warriors releasing for the PS2 in 2004. I hate that this is the only Onimusha game I've talked about on the channel so far, and it's the fighting game spinoff. So what even is this game? Well, this game is a spinoff in the Onimusha series and takes place between 2 and 3. And the game sees a bunch of Onimusha characters really just going at it. The game plays much more like Super Smash Brothers rather than, say, Samurai Showdown. But even compared to Smash, there are a few unique aspects to this game. You know, you can jump and you can actually switch planes depending on the level, which is unique. But there's a bunch of standard sword fighting techniques here. I mean, everyone has swords, so there's combos, there's blocks. You can actually do these block breaking kicks. There's items. You can even disarm your opponents. There's also a few original aspects from the Onimusha series like the soul absorption and some special elemental attacks like lightning, fire, and wind. And you know, it's kind of cool how they actually threw in a bunch of Onimusha elements to really just kind of give it its own flair or identity. But is it a good fighting game? Is it a fun time? Well, I haven't played much of this game, but from what I have, yeah, I didn't really enjoy it all that much. Look, it seems decent enough and it's got some cool elements and the Mega Man cameos are actually pretty sick and super out of place like it just looks really weird and i don't really know why they were put here but it's still cool nonetheless but this game it just never really clicked with me i was just never having much of a fun time and it felt kind of shallow like that's with everything i mentioned all those mechanics and all the onimusha flair it just didn't really feel like a rewarding fun experience again it felt kind of shallow and maybe if i played this in a party setting it would have been a lot of fun but playing through the arcade mode a little bit and just trying a couple of the characters i was like I'm not really having a great time with this, it just kind of feels like a lesser Smash Bros. It feels like a lesser Beautiful Joe Red Hot Rumble even. The game's certainly not bad, I just wouldn't say it's anything above average or slightly above average. Maybe this is just a totally tubular hot take, but yeah, I wasn't huge on this one. And so here we have SNK vs. Capcom SVC Chaos releasing in 2003. So this game was not developed or published by Capcom, rather SNK, but I know that if I did not talk about this game, y'all would be after me. So here we go, we're going to talk about the non-Capcom game and the Capcom fighting game list. So this game kind of has a plot and a premise with like order and chaos and the fate of the universe and all that, and I mean... It, it, it certainly exists, I will give it that. There is a premise here. Now, when it comes to the characters, the game has 36 characters from, you know, SNK and Capcom. And it's a decent roster. It's not Capcom versus SNK too good, but it is a decent enough roster. You know, there's plenty of Fatal Fury and King of Fighters characters and Street Fighter characters, but there's actually characters from Metal Slug, Samurai Showdown, Ghosts and Goblins, and even Mega Man Zero. Yeah, it's alright. Now when it comes to the gameplay, it plays very much like an SNK game. It plays much more like the King of Fighters series, really King of Fighters 2002, which is one of the best ones. It has a very similar feel, and it has the same 4-button configuration, and a bunch of the same techniques. And so it is a little weird with the Capcom characters coming in, you know, a lot of them are used to 6 buttons, we got 4 buttons now, but it's not unplayable, it's not crazy stiff or hard to get into. I mean, if you've played any of the King of Fighters, you'll feel right at home, but for someone who only plays Capcom, Capcom games, if you come into this, it's going to feel a bit stiff, it's going to feel a bit weird, and it's certainly different. SNK games have always been a little stiffer and just harder to get into. They're, they're certainly more difficult than the Capcom ones, but I think this game, while it doesn't have a great balance, it's, it's okay to get into. Something that seems strange for a crossover is that the game actually does not use the team battle format, but follows a traditional round-based one-on-one format. The game does introduce a new technique called the front grand step, which allows the player to cancel attacks with a forward dash. 
This is interesting. I don't know how well this is executed though, especially from a casual perspective. The game also uses a different type of power gauge known as the Groove Power Gauge System, which has three levels. And with these, you can perform super special moves, a guard cancel attack, or even a guard cancel front step maneuver. When the gauge is full, it reaches maximum level and a max activation occurs. During a max activation, the gauge will change into a timer and the player gains the ability to cancel any of their moves anytime. And on top of this, each character has an exceed move, which can only be performed once when the player's life is less than half. All of this comes together to make a decent enough fighting game. Look, I'm gonna be real, I'd rather play any of the Capcom vs SNK games and I'd rather play most of the King of Fighters games over this one. Like, it just feels like a weird mix of both of them and it's not as smooth as I'd like it and it's a bit hard to get into. Like, there's a decent balance here and I'm sure there's a decent fighting game here. But I really wasn't ever able to get all that into this game. And then the presentation was just kind of weak. Like, it just didn't really look that good. A lot of the sprites just look reused. There are some new ones here. It just didn't really do it for me. I, I don't know. This game, it just never really clicked with me. And I just didn't ever get all that into it. Maybe because it leans heavier on the SNK side than the Capcom side. But yeah, I just wasn't really able to get into this one. Maybe this isn't the hottest take that this game isn't so great. But I wanted to like it. It's just... I didn't really care all that much for it. Look, it's okay, and you could certainly do a lot worse. You could play those shitty Capcom SNK card games. I'd rather play this over those, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend this one too much. And so here we have Street Fighter EX3 releasing for the PS2 in 2000. This game was not developed by Capcom, but rather Eureka. And I'll be real, while I thought EX was interesting at first, you know, a 3D Street Fighter by the third game, I was like... I don't know about this one and trying it nowadays yeah there's a reason so many people do not talk about EX3 so I guess the first thing to bring up is the 3D now the 3D in this game yeah it does not look good like this was a PS2 launch title and this game really doesn't look any better than the PS1 the models and animation just straight up do not look good and the environments also don't look good. Now keep in mind Tekken Tag Tournament also was a PS2 launch title and <laughs> that game looks significantly better than this one and animates significantly better as well. Like this game I wouldn't be surprised if it used just a bunch of the same animation from EX2. It looks like it honestly does. It just looks really stiff and clunky and it's probably one of the reasons people thought Street Fighter and 3D just doesn't work together until Street Fighter 4 came out and proved everyone wrong. And then we get to the gameplay, like this game plays incredibly similar to Street Fighter EX2 and I didn't think EX2 played all that great, I thought it was just okay and this game, you know, it just doesn't feel like they really improved on anything. You get to choose two characters and you can switch mid-fight like Tekken Tag Tournament, only Tekken Tag Tournament has, you know, much better tagging mechanics and just all around is a better fighting game, but it's something you can do here. The guard break is gone, instead we have this surprise blow, but really it's not all that different. In fact, the gameplay, even with these little changes, again, it's just so similar to EX2, which I thought was like, okay at best. I don't think this game is any better than EX2 in terms of its gameplay, and I think from a sequel you should expect it to play a little better. This game just feels tired. It just feels tired, like they ran out of ideas. Or maybe they weren't done cooking and they just pushed it out because they wanted it to launch with the PS2. Like, it just doesn't feel like enough of an improvement over EX2 to even be worth playing, honestly. Like, the character roster is, like, exactly the same outside of two new characters. And the other thing worth mentioning is EX2 wasn't some huge hit. It wasn't some mega classic that people loved and Capcom just kind of pushed out another one that was basically the same. No, EX2 was, like, okay at best. And here we are getting basically the same game again with some minor tweaks. Yeah, no, I'm not really interested, and I don't think you should be either. There's a reason this game is just totally forgotten. I know over the years, a number of people have gone back and said, oh, EX3 is actually pretty decent. You know, a lot of people didn't like it then and give it a chance, but it's actually all right. I don't know about that one. Even nowadays, I've just never really been a big fan of this game, and I just think it's nothing special. You could do better in the EX series and way better in the Street Fighter series, and I'd recommend almost every Street Fighter game over this one. And so here we have Beautiful Joe Red Hot Rumble releasing for the GameCube in 2005. Now this game is a spin-off in the Beautiful Joe series and I'll just be real with it, it's a Smash clone. This game really just through and through is a Smash clone. It's very similar to Smash in its setup and its style and its gameplay and back when it came out people went why would I want to play this when I could play Melee on the same console and it's kind of funny to look at nowadays because so many people like Smash clones. But look, this isn't one of the best Smash clones. It's a fun little button masher that you can have some fun with, especially in a party setting, but it's nothing all that special. 
This game doesn't exactly have a lot of depth or mechanics that really go deep. In fact, Smash just kind of runs circles around this game when it comes to depth. But you know what? This game does have a story mode. It actually is a story mode and it is based off of the anime. The story is Captain Blue making a new movie and he wants to figure out who's going to be the lead role and so what does he do? He hosts a tournament basically and has everyone fight each other over the lead role. I mean, it's an interesting little setup. It's a fine setup for what it is and it's cool that there's actually a story here. But it explains why all of the characters are coming together to fight each other. When it comes to the roster, yeah, it's got all the beautiful Joe characters. It's got Joe, it's got all his friends and his enemies that may or may not be way cooler than Joe himself. Unfortunately, like all of these characters play the same. I think it's one of the weaker parts of this game is that nobody really feels unique. Everyone just kind of feels the same and it's a really basic button masher really is what it feels like and what it plays like. Sure, you get some other missions and there are some other objectives, but again, it's a very basic button masher where you just kind of beat the crap out of each other, collect coins or do whatever the objective is. At least aesthetically, the game is in line with Beautiful Joe, the music's alright, it's got that sense of humor and personality that the games really have, and so I mean, it nails the Beautiful Joe look and feel, it's just, this game feels too basic for its own good, and really I'd rather play almost any other Beautiful Joe game. I think fans of the Beautiful Joe series will get a kick out of this one, and if you haven't tried it and you like Beautiful Joe, then yeah, I think it's worth trying. But for everyone else, especially fighting game aficionados or people who really are, get into in-depth fighting games, yeah, you can skip this one. Just go play Smash or any of the other platform fighters we have nowadays. And so here we have Fate Unlimited Codes. This game was developed by 8ing and published by Capcom. It wasn't released in the US until the PSP in 2009. Now this game, I'll be real, I'm probably not the right person to talk about this game. I know absolutely nothing about Fate. I debated and went back and forth even including this game on the list, but you know what, it is published by Capcom, so here we are, we're gonna talk about it. So what is this game? The game is based on the very Japanese visual novel series Fate Stay Night, and it sees a bunch of the characters from said series coming together to battle it out. This is a 3D fighting game, and you know, while I want to say it's similar to Soul Calibur, it's not in a ton of other ways. You can move into the background, the foreground, you know, you can walk up and down, but when it comes to striking and just how the game flows, it's kind of unique. The control scheme is a bit interesting. It's got a three button setup, and then the fourth button is used to cancel your own attacks or block enemy attacks. And as you attack your enemy and get attacked, you know, energy builds up, and there's a couple different super moves you have in this game. But yeah, you're just beating the shit out of each other with some of your favorite anime characters from this series, I guess. Again, I have absolutely no clue what's going on in this game or who any of these characters are. You know, I just picked some of them and was like, oh, she looks cool. Oh, he looks like he can do some damage. I don't freaking know, man. I just tried this game for a little bit and thought it was all right. I mean, I didn't exactly get wowed by it and it didn't really make me interested in the series. I didn't want to check out the Fate Stay Night series after playing this, so maybe it's one of those games where you gotta really be invested in the property and the original source material to really enjoy this fighting game to the fullest. So again, maybe I'm not the right person to really be looking at this game as someone who is an outsider. This game, it seems fine enough. The fighting seems all right. The speed and pacing of the fights it seemed fine enough, the controls were alright, it wasn't super stiff and I was able to pull off some combos here and there. While the systems here don't seem the most developed, I mean it seems more than competent enough. I couldn't tell you if you know this is like a really balanced or deep fight or anything like that, I just didn't really spend enough time with it to tell you that. There's an arcade mode to mess around with and each of the characters have like a story and then there's also like these mini games and missions here which they exist, can't really tell you much about it. There is like multiplayer but it's PSP games so yeah. At least it looks alright for the PSP, I'm not gonna say it like wowed me, but yeah, it looks alright and the music's decent enough. There's a lot of voice acting here, it's all Japanese, but there's a, there's certainly a lot of talking here. Look, like I said, I'm probably not the best person to talk about this game. If you like the Fate Stay Night series, you probably have already played this or you really enjoy this game. I think if you like that series, you'll probably like this game. If you're looking for a decent fighting game, you could probably look elsewhere. I'd say the most comparable fighting game to this is Soul Calibur Broken Destiny. And I'd rather play Soul Calibur Broken Destiny. But this seems like a fine little fighting game for what it is that fans of the series probably enjoy. Or maybe they really hate it and I'm just totally out of touch here, but either way, that's this game. And so here we have Street Fighter EX2 originally releasing in 1998. The game, as the title implies, is a sequel to Street Fighter EX, the 3D spin-off of the Street Fighter series. 
And this game, uh, it's just alright. To be as reductive as possible, this game really is just Street Fighter EX with the addition of Excel combos and a few new characters. And so what are Excel combos? It's basically just the custom combos from Street Fighter Alpha. But outside of that, the gameplay is virtually identical to Street Fighter EX1. It feels really the same. It doesn't feel any better or worse. It controls just fine. It's not super stiff, but it doesn't have a very good feel to it. The pacing, the speed, and the general flow of these fights, it's okay, but it's just okay. I'd rather have this though than any of those 3D SNK games, but you line this up against Virtua Fighter or any Tekken game and it just kind of gets obliterated. And the same kind of goes for the graphics. The graphics in this game are not so hot. It's obviously very blocky and the animation is okay for the time. It wasn't like amazing, at least the music's pretty decent. It even got a physical CD release, so that's kind of cool. Now, when it comes to this game's characters, it's very similar to EX1, you know, a number of characters return. There's actually some original characters here, which is interesting to see. One of them is named Cracker Jack, no relation to the food, unfortunately, but the character roster, I mean, it's alright, and then the later version of this game, EX2+, Plus, it adds even more characters, I mean, right there's basically EX's three rosters, so I guess it was actually pretty solid. Look, EX2, it's not terrible, it's not bad, but it's not really good either. It just kind of sits in the middle, it exists, it's alright, I don't got much to say about it. I've never really had much fun with this game, but I've never hated it either. It's just very middle of the road for me, and I don't know if I could really recommend it. I'd say you should probably try just about any other Street Fighter game. And so here we have Plasma Sword Nightmare of Bill Stein, also known as Star Gladiator 2, releasing for the Dreamcast in 99. So this game is the sequel to Star Gladiator, and it actually does continue that game's story. It sees Bill Stein coming back and just wrecking havoc, basically. The story and aesthetic are actually cool in this game, and it's still unique all these years later. When it comes to the character roster, there's plenty of returning faces here and a few new ones as well, and each of them have their own motivation and little story in here. I'm not going to say they all play the most different, though. In fact, when it comes to the fighting in this game, it is a 3D weapon-based fighter, similar to, say, Soul Calibur. And I'll be real, comparing this game to Soul Calibur, that's a bit generous. Like I just mentioned, these characters don't feel all that different. Unlike Soul Calibur, where they all feel extremely different from each other, this game does not feel as nice or play as nice as Soul Calibur. It does not have the depth that Soul Calibur has, and it's just nowhere near as much fun as Soul Calibur. But that's the last we're mentioning of that game. How is this game on its own? It's okay, you know, like I said, there's not a lot of depth. It is very flashy. They introduce this really unique game mechanic that are these super moves where you fill up a bar and like it does a ton of damage and it's really flash. Okay, I'm being sarcastic. Look, every game is a freaking super. The original did not though. This game does. And it feels like a bit of a button masher, more so than a lot of these other fighting games that I've brought up. But I mean, it's not the worst time. The game's got a unique aesthetic. It's got some decent music. The presentation as a whole is alright and some fun can be had here. It won't keep you hooked for hours, and it's not one of those unforgettable multiplayer experiences that you find yourself coming back to every couple years. It's not that. But what it is, is a couple hours of fun if you just want to try something different and see a different 3D weapon-based fighter. Would I recommend this game over the original? No, I think the original is just slightly better. But, you know, you could do a lot worse on the Dreamcast than this game. And so here we have Spawn in the Demon's Hand, released for the Dreamcast in 2000. Now Spawn? Spawn's pretty sick. I like Spawn, and he has an okay enough reputation with games. I mean, that PlayStation game sucks, but this game actually does not. I've actually played quite a bit of this one, and I've always had a fun time with this one. And I've played this game with friends, and yeah, it was a total blast. So this game is pretty different from most Capcom fighting games. It is a 3D arena fighter. So the game sees you choosing one of many, and I do mean many, spawn characters. There's actually 37 spawn characters to choose from in this game. Yeah, there's a lot. So you choose a character, and then you're dropped into an arena, and you usually just gotta kill each other. There's technically three modes to the game. There's the boss rush mode, where you gotta defeat the bosses in each stage within the time limit to earn points. There's a team battle mode, where you just gotta defeat the other team to win. And a battle royale, which is where players gotta defeat all the enemies to win. Really, in the end, what it comes down to is you're just trying to defeat everybody. Unless they're on your team in that team battle mode, otherwise, yeah, you're just defeating everything that moves, basically. Like I said, you're dropped into these arenas, you're killing everyone. How are you going to do this, though? There's a bunch of weapons scattered all over. There's guns, there's melee weapons to maim each other with, and they all feel decently different from each other, and they all have different attributes. Some weapons, yeah, they're clearly better than others. I mean, guns are just kind of always going to be better than melee weapons in many scenarios. 
but at least it's not like ungodly balanced. It still feels like there was some thought and care put into this, and I like how the weapons feel. It actually does feel satisfying and just slaying the other people. Yeah, it's fun. I think this is a decent little arena fighter, but I will be the first to admit that it takes some time to get used to this game. The first time I played it, I was like, what the hell is going on? How do I do anything? What are the controls? This game is weird, and yeah, it takes a second to get used to, but I think you can come to grips with it in just a few minutes. And yes, it is quite unconventional, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good time. Like I have, like I said, had fun with this game. I've played through the arcade mode and it's it's decently fun. The multiplayer is really where everything shines. And this game, it's got a kick-ass soundtrack. It's got a decent presentation. And the gameplay, you could certainly do a lot worse than the gameplay here. I'm not going to act like I really like Arena Fighters. I really don't. But this is one of the few games that, yeah, I like it. And I think there's some fun to be had with it. Does it have a lot of depth? Is it going to wow you? Is it going to keep you coming back? Does it control all that well? The answer is no to all of these. And that's why it's not the highest on this list. But it's still a little bit of fun. Maybe this game is just a guilty pleasure and I like Spawn too much. But I think the game is worth trying. It's not going to amaze you. But, you know... Fans of Spawn or Arena Fighters or Party Games, yeah, I think you'll have some fun with this one. And so here we have Saturday Night Slam Masters releasing in 93. Now Saturday Night Slam Masters, if you couldn't tell, is really inspired by 80s, 90s, WWF, and eventually WCW. It is a pro wrestling fighting game, one of the only ones Capcom's ever made. While there were plenty of pro wrestling games around this time, and there's plenty of pro wrestling games nowadays, Saturday Night Slam Masters has always been unique because it really is just a fighting game in a wrestling format. It plays very much like a fighting game, more than it does a wrestling game. It really combines wrestling and a fighting game. So, you know, there's like inputs and you have a health bar like a traditional fighting game, but there's plenty of other wrestling things involved. Like, you know, there's taunts going up on the ring apron, ring outs. You have to actually pin someone to win. Yeah, it's actually like a wrestling game with some fighting game stuff in it. And this game, it's actually a blast. Saturday Night Slam Masters is, in my opinion, like the best wrestling game of the early 90s. Obviously, you know, like No Mercy and WCW vs. NWO Revenge and all those other ones would show up in the late 90s to really dominate the wrestling genre of video games, but the early 90s? I'd much rather play Saturday Night Slam Masters than any of those early WWF games. So you get to choose a number of different characters. Obviously, we're going with my man Mike Hager. I recognize him, so yeah, we're going with Hager. And then you do the graps, you do the grabbing, you do the attacking, you can even jump in this game, you can kind of freely move around also, it's not just a 2D plane, so you can freely move around, you can interact with the ropes and the turnbuckle, you can go out of the ring and fight on the side. As you perform attacks and as the match continues, eventually you can do some special attacks like a non-grappling technique and of course a finisher. And when you finish someone off, like I said, you gotta actually pin them. Just defeating them is not enough. Or you can make them submit. But either way, just draining their health bar is not going to finish the match. And so with all this, I'm sure the question being posed is, is the game even any fun nowadays? The answer is yes. The game actually is still fun. Look, I got a soft spot for old wrestling games. Yeah, it's stiff as shit. And it can be a bit clunky and awkward to walk around. And it has an age the greatest in the controls area. But it's still fun. It's still satisfying to just pummel the shit out of each other do some big wrestling moves, do the finisher, win the match, one, two, three. Yeah, I think that's still actually fun. Is it a bit clunky? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely clunky. It does feel a bit weird. And it certainly takes some time to get used to. You're not going to be able to pick this one up and understand it immediately. But, you know, after even a couple minutes, I, I, I think you'll get a decent hang of it. There is an arcade mode here. It isn't the longest. But where this game really shines is, you know, the multiplayer. Where else is this game going to shine? It actually goes up to four players, which is pretty sick. And I've never gotten to try that, but I would love to one day because it looks like it's a blast. The presentation is good. It's actually pretty top-notch for the time. The music is solid enough. And playing this, it makes me wish that somehow Capcom got the WWF license. I think they could have created one of the best wrestling games ever. Because this game, it's a ton of fun. I'd rather play it than a bunch of other wrestling games, especially from the 90s. And I would say that this game, it's a little underrated. You know, I don't hear too many people ever bring this game up. And, I mean, it doesn't have a lot of depth. It doesn't have a lot of longevity or replayability. It's not the most satisfying, and it might not even be balanced. But I think it still is fun. It's still satisfying. It's still a good time. And really, that's what matters at the end of the day. Or maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about as usual. That is always a very real possibility. It's also worth bringing up that there is a re-release of this game known as Muscle Bomber Duo Ultimate Team Battle. 
which isn't a sequel and it's not really enough of its own game to get its own entry here. What it is is basically the original game, but only with the two on two battle mode. I haven't really played much of this one, so I couldn't tell you if there's really any other differences aside from that, but it doesn't seem like it's much different from the original and both of them are good fun. And so here we have Ring of Destruction Slam Masters 2 releasing in 94. Most people don't even know that this game exists. It is the follow-up to Saturday Night Slam Masters and it's enough of its own game to get its own entry and I'm going to spotlight it for a second and say this game is a blast. If you like the original Saturday Night Slam Masters or you like wrestling games, you are going to like this game. It's much less of a regular wrestling game and more so of a fighting game now. While the original game had some wrestling elements, this game plays much more like a traditional fighting game. You can't free really walk around anymore it is just a two-dimensional plane in a wrestling ring which is kind of goofy it's a lot more of a straightforward fighting game and even as a fighting game control style where you have two punches two kicks and a grappling button there's definitely an emphasis on the grappling i mean it is a wrestling game and there are plenty of wrestling moves here there's plenty of those power moves that you're looking for but another wrestling element that is sadly gone is having to either pin or submit your opponent now it's more traditional, you just beat the shit out of them, win two out of three rounds, and you'll win. Now, despite these changes, I think the game is still actually decently fun. I still had a good time with it. It feels nice. It's easier to pick up and play than the first one. It doesn't feel as clunky, especially because it is more of a traditional fighting game. And doing all the power moves, it's still just as satisfying as it was in the first one. All 10 of the original characters from the first game are here. There's four new characters, but you know we're still playing as my man Hagar. Like, he kicks more ass than anyone else. I always love Hagar. And this game just kicks ass. I would say this game's actually a bit underrated. And the main reason is it's still an arcade only game. The only way to play this game is through an arcade emulator or finding it in the wild, which isn't going to happen. I'm surprised with all these Capcom collections, especially the fighting game collection, we haven't seen this game officially come to a console. Like, it just seems really silly. And I think that... When one day it does get re-released because I'm hopeful and trust Capcom, I think people are really going to recognize that this game is actually a bit of fun. Is it the most thoughtful? Is it going to provide more than a few hours of fun? Is it the most balanced or deep or any of that? No, it's not. But sometimes you just need some big, dumb fun, brother. And so here we have Star Gladiator Episode 1 Final Crusade releasing for the PS1 in 96. Now this game... I have heard it called Star Wars x Capcom before and you know, that's not the most inaccurate statement. The game takes place in the far, far future where humans have been exploring vast reaches of outer space for many centuries and tried to establish peaceful contact with various alien civilizations. And it sees this technology being developed known as plasma power. This technology was created by the scientist known as Bill Stein who ends up becoming the main antagonist of the game and it's up to a bunch of characters to try to stop him. The setting and the aesthetic and the characters are actually rather different from most of Capcom's fighting games. It's actually very unique, especially when you look at all of their fighting games. Yeah, the Star Gladiator series is unique in that sense, and I think it's a cool aesthetic, it's a cool setting, and I'm surprised Capcom has really never touched on it again after that second game. This game has a bunch of cool characters also, more than just Hayato, who's been in Marvel vs. Capcom. There's actually a number of cool characters here. And it seems for the most part that these characters actually do feel different from each other. There isn't as many characters as the second game, but I'd much rather have characters that feel and play different than a bunch of similar characters. Now when it comes to the actual fighting, I hate to say it, the most obvious comparison is still Soul Calibur. It's clear this game took some inspiration from it and is very similar to it, not only in its controls, but just general gameplay. Again, not as in-depth as Soul Calibur, is not as nice as Soul Calibur, and is not as fun as Soul Calibur, but it's still a fun time. And really, it's these two characters beating the shit out of each other with a bunch of futuristic weapons and not lightsabers. And I think the fighting here is still alright, it's still relatively easy in modern day to pick this game up and have some fun with it. It's not super clunky or stiff or janky as hell, like it actually feels nice still and there are some satisfying moments to it still. The game does have some mechanics, it has these like plasma reverses. And the game even has this unique combo system known as the plasma combo system. This is where any depth is with this game and it's a shame the sequel dropped it because I actually think it's pretty decent here and it's interesting. And so what you have here is actually a bit of a forgotten hidden gem. It's still fun, it's still easy to pick up and play, there is a little depth, and the aesthetic and setting are very cool. It sounds nice and it even plays nice, and I think that if you haven't tried this game and are looking for maybe a different kind of fighting game that's a bit older, I mean, this might be worth checking out with some friends. 
I just still do not understand why Capcom has not even tried to bring this series back. It feels like there's a ton of potential with it, like it really does. But hey, at least we got this game. I'd rather play the first one over the sequel just thanks to the combo system alone, and yeah, it's still pretty cool and worth playing. And here we have Mega Man The Power Battle releasing for arcades originally in 95, but the game has since been re-released on many other collections, and that's where I played it. In fact, I actually remember getting the Mega Man Anniversary Collection as a kid on GameCube and being just really shocked that there was this Mega Man fighting game. I had never even heard of it, and I was like, whoa, what is this game? This game's cool. And yeah, all these years later, Mega Man The Power Battle is still actually pretty cool, and it is quite unique from most Capcom fighting games. The game has a pretty simple to understand plot. I mean, Dr. Wily's rebuilt some of his robot masters and trying to take over the world, and so it's up to Mega Man, Proto Man, and Base to stop him. You can play as either of those three characters, and you can actually play the whole game in co-op. And what you'll do is take on the robot masters. There's some other bosses here, but every level is just boss fight to boss fight, basically. There's no level itself, there's no platforming or anything like that. It really is just fight to fight, and the fight themselves they're actually very similar to regular Mega Man, I know, who would have guessed? You'll be dodging the Robot Master's attack and constantly whittling at their health. Once you actually defeat them, you'll get their weapon, and you can use their weapon against other Robot Masters with the switch of a button, and the game retains the whole rock, paper, scissors element where some weapons are super effective against other Robot Masters. Obviously, this is the Mega Man loop, just now it's a bunch of fights, and you know, it controls and feels different from regular Mega Man. Regular Mega Man, sometimes it can feel pretty sluggish, a little tank-like almost at times, just because he's so heavy. But also, come on man, you gotta cut those games some slack, those were NES games. This game though, yeah, it's a lot smoother, it's easy to just pick up, play, it's very accessible, really only one button is used outside of changing weapons and jumping. And a lot of the game, really most of the game, is just understanding the patterns and understanding the Robot Masters and just being able to dodge all their attacks and just hitting them enough times so that they die before you do. It's not exactly the most complex fighting game, it's much more of a Mega Man game than a fighting game. But I still think there is some fun to be had here. As a kid, I really did like this game. I played through it with all the characters numerous times and had a ton of fun. Nowadays, yeah, it's not amazing, but it still is a fun time. There is some multiplayer here, and the presentation at the very least kicks some ass. Not only does it look pretty good, but it is some excellent, and I mean excellent music. Like, the music really slaps in this game. Mega Man always got good music. When it comes to recommending this game though, I don't know how much I can recommend it. I mean, it's in a bunch of collections now, so if you've got one of the collections, I think it's worth trying, but seeking this game out on its own, I don't know about that one. If you like Mega Man, yeah, it's totally worth playing. If you really love Mega Man, you've probably already played this. If you like fighting games but don't really care for Mega Man, I don't know how much you're going to like this one. But before we're done here, I'm going to give Mega Man Battle and Fighters a shout out. This was released for the Neo Geo Pocket Color and is basically a demake of Mega Man The Power Battle. It plays basically the same, it's just, you know, it's like 8-bit, it looks like old Mega Man, it controls more like regular old school Mega Man and the music is a lot more compressed. This game never actually left Japan until it was recently released for the Switch, which is how you could play it now. I'd say you really should just stick to the regular power battle, but it's cool that this Neo Geo Pocket Color version is more accessible than ever before. All in all, the power battle, it's a good game. I wouldn't say it's, you know, stellar, revolutionary, innovative, or any of those nice words, but it's still a good game. And here we have Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters releasing originally in the arcades in 96, but has since been re-released on other collections, which is how I played this game as well. Now Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters, you know, this game, very very similar to the last Mega Man fighting game. I mean, you can just look at it and you can see that it's very similar. It controls the same, it feels the same, it almost looks the same, it sounds very similar, and the plot really is the same as well more robot masters show up and so yeah it's up to our cast to take them out and some other bosses so this game it does introduce a new character it adds duo for Mega Man 8 and he plays a little differently from Proto Man and base and Mega Man but the general gameplay yeah it's basically the same plays very much like a Mega Man game you're dodging attacks from the robot masters you're defeating them there's the rock paper scissors dynamic with all the weaknesses you are understanding patterns and really just playing to your character's strengths. The Robot Master selection here is different from the first game and I think it's a fine enough selection and the boss you fight at the end with the dragon, that one's pretty cool also. Like the first game, the presentation is solid enough and the music, oh, the music really slaps in this game. The music is just excellent. I mean Mega Man, pretty much every Mega Man game's got good music and this game, 
yeah, the music absolutely bangs, it slaps, it smacks, it does whatever it needs to do, I guess. If you like the first Mega Man fighting game, you're gonna like this game also. I would say this game is only slightly, and I mean slightly better than the first one. I don't think it's gonna convert any non-Mega Man fans into Mega Man fans. If you like Mega Man, you're gonna like this game. If you like fighting games, you'll probably think it's okay at least, but I wouldn't exactly say go seek this out on its own. It's in a bunch of collections, so, you know, if you got one of the collections with it, it's worth trying. And so here we have Street Fighter EX releasing originally in 96. So this was the first Street Fighter game to ever have 3D graphics. And honestly, out of all the EX games, this is the one I would rather play the most. Sure, the other games might feel a little smoother and have more characters, but I just think the original EX was the best one. It also was the most novel, especially for the time this was the first time that these characters were being rendered in 3D. And graphically, you know, it does look a bit weird, but I think it still looks alright. Some of the animation is rather stiff and it looks on par with like Virtua Fighter, but I'd rather look at this than any of those ugly ass 3D Samurai Showdown games, so there is that. So when it comes down to the fighting mechanics, it's all right here. The game is not as fast as say Darkstalkers or any of the Super Street Fighters or Alphas or any of those. It is 3D versus the sprites, so you know the speed had to be altered a little bit. When you jump and land, yeah it is quite a bit slower, but I still think the pacing of the fights, it's alright. The game still absolutely does play like a Street Fighter game, like special moves and supers are done the same way as they would be done in any other Street Fighter game. If you know how to play as Ken or Ryu in the other games, you're gonna know how to play as them here. One thing that is different is how supers are done in this game. The EX series does feature a super meter with three separate sections rather than levels, which is unique and it's its own thing. It doesn't really change all that much though. Another mechanic this game has is the guard break, which is where you can actually break the guard and make the opponent dizzy and then you can just totally wail on them. This is also in like Street Fighter Alpha, but here you actually like full on stun them and everything and you could just pummel the shit out of them. The fighting in this game doesn't have as much depth as the other Street Fighter games. It's not as fun, it's not as fast paced, it's not as pretty as the other Street Fighter games, but what you have here is a decent little fighter. At least the music slaps, like the music is actually really good in this game, it's like my favorite of the EX games, like, dang, that music's really good. So we haven't talked about the characters yet, let's talk about them. This game does have 23 characters in the home release, and you know, a bunch of these characters are Street Fighter mainstays, but there's actually a decent amount of new characters introduced here as well, like Cracker Jack, like Skullomania. And while I'm not gonna say, you know, it's one of the best roster Street Fighters ever had, it really goes to show that the other EX games didn't really improve much on this original roster. Like, they added just a couple characters here and there for each release. The original roster was actually decent. And you know, I think this game is actually decent. Out of all the EX games, this is really the only one that I can say it's actually worth trying. You might really like something here. It's different. It doesn't play like all the other Street Fighter games. And if you're looking for a more traditional game, you should just stay away from it. But it's different. It's fun. It's unique. And most importantly, it's got a bitchin' bangin' ass soundtrack. And so here we have Super Gem Fighter Mini Mix, releasing originally in 97. Now this is a pretty strange, just kind of bizarre fighting game. If you couldn't immediately tell, the game uses those super deformed character designs previously used in Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, a puzzle game that I will not be talking about today, sadly. And it puts all of them and the gems into a fighting game to make one of the most bizarre fighting games Capcom truly has ever made. In fact, I would say this game is a mix of not only Street Fighter and Darkstalkers and Puzzle Fighter, but seemingly every Capcom game at the time. Like, everything is referenced here. Resident Evil, Mega Man, Ghosts and Goblins, even Red Earth is here. But what kind of a fighting game is this? It's a bit far from a traditional fighting game, I will say that. The control scheme is different from Street Fighter with a punch, kick, special, and taunt button. But the fighting itself, you know, it isn't the furthest from, say, Street Fighter. Obviously, it's very simplified, and a lot of combos are simplified. But if you know combos or specials for, say, a Street Fighter character like Ken, it'll work here. But that's really the most traditional aspect of the fighting. There's a lot more going on here. The special attacks are all over the place and are just weird. Like, Chun-Li becomes Jill Valentine from Resident Evil, Felicia becomes Mega Man, and as you're fighting, gems will show up like in Red Earth and you can power up your characters and their moves, getting new moves, abilities, attacks. And this game plays and feels just like a wild, weird mix of Capcom stuff, but it is good fun. I'm not going to say there's a ton of depth here or that it's the most balanced fighter, but 
shit this game was fun it was fun to just try all the characters see what kind of crazy references get thrown in next or just what kind of crazy shit you can pull off and after just a few hours of playing with my buddy on the capcom fighting collection we both agreed this game is super fun is it as deep and rewarding and serious as a majority of capcom fighting games no of course not and it doesn't stand up in terms of its depth or its mechanics or anything like that. It's just a dumbass party game where you just beat the crap out of each other and a bunch of crazy ass stuff happens, a bunch of crazy moves and references get thrown in here. And ultimately it does what every fighting game should strive to be, fun. It's just a fun time. It's not going to last more than a few hours. It's not going to be really rewarding. You're not going to want to come back to it every couple years or something, but you'll have a few hours of fun with this one and sometimes that's all you need. Oh, and the game has a Wonder Swan port because, you know, if I didn't mention that, someone might tell me in the comments. So, yeah, it has a Wonder Swan port. And so, here we have the original Darkstalkers, Darkstalkers the Night Warriors, releasing all the way back in arcades in 94. Now, something everyone immediately noticed about Darkstalkers was that it had a totally different theme and atmosphere going about it than no other fighting game series had going at the time. Instead of it being, you know, just casual people fighting each other, maybe like warriors of some kind, not here. It was monsters. It was gothic monsters. It was like classic folklore monsters here. Like werewolves and vampires and zombies and succubuses. And this game just had this style that no other fighting games really had at this time. Not only did it look amazing for the time, but just the aesthetics in general were really unseen. It was one of the first games to use Capcom's new arcade board, and it really pushed the hardware to its limits. When it came to the character roster, like I said, they were all folklore monsters, but there were some really iconic characters immediately spawned in this game, like Felicia, like Morgan, like Dimitri, like Bishimon, and the list goes on and on. It's one of the most iconic parts of the entire game is really the character roster. In fact, I'd argue that some of these characters have gotten more popular than this entire series, like Morgan. And even all these years later, I think the roster is still really cool. And so what are all these monsters going to do? Well, they're going to fight each other, of course. Now, there is a story to this game. It's about this alien demon Pyron invading Earth to add to his collection of planets. And the world's most fearsome monsters are the last defense of the planet. But like every fighting game from the 90s, the story isn't too important here. What's really important is the fighting and the mechanics. And I gotta say that this game, you know, while it has aged in a number of different aspects, it still actually feels pretty decent to play nowadays. It is not aged badly, actually. It's actually aged quite well for 94. It's aged better than a lot of, say, SNK's fighting games from the early 90s. I'd say when it comes to its core fighting mechanics, it's closest to Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. However, there are a bunch of new additions here that were new for Capcom fighting games at the time, such as air blocking, crouch walking, and even chain combos. The game features a special meter similar to the Super Combo Gauge, and each player could perform a unique combo much like the Super Turbo one. It's called ES in Darkstalkers. And something unique about the special in Darkstalkers is that it drains over time. You can't just save it for the last minute like you can in most fighting games. You actually want to use your super move as soon as possible, really. But I think all of this leads to a pretty fun fighting game where you're just beating the crap out of each other with some of your favorite monsters. The game is decently fast for the time. It's not like crazy fast, but I'd say it's on the level of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo and it's got a good pace to it. I've had some fun in the multiplayer with the boys. And it's cool that all these years later, the game is still pretty approachable and you can play it on modern hardware with the Capcom Fighting Collection. And so if you want to see where the Darkstalker series got its start, I have no problem recommending the game. I think you'll get a fun little time out of it. And here we have X-Men Children of the Atom, originally releasing in 94. Now, before we had Marvel vs. Capcom, or X-Men vs. Street Fighter, or even the Marvel Super Heroes fighting game, we had X-Men Children of the Atom. This was the first Capcom-developed Marvel fighting game. And I gotta say, all these years later, if you play it in the modern day, this game's actually alright. Especially if you're familiar with any of the later games I just mentioned, then yeah, you'll feel kind of like you're coming home here. Just to a much smaller home with less features, depth, characters, and slightly only slightly worse graphics and that's not a knock on this game that's not to say that it's a bad game or that it's aged terribly it's just that the other marvel vs capcom games really just improved on the foundation that this game set down like they continuously improved on what this game had to have better and better games each time so this original game yeah it's not as good as those later ones but that's a good thing now, if I had to compare the gameplay of this game to any other Capcom fighting game, I'd say it feels the most similar to Darkstalkers. It's a similar speed, similar feel, and about as satisfying and just as fun. 
I mean, really, if you've played any Capcom fighting game from the 90s, you're going to be able to pick this one up and understand how it plays pretty much immediately. This game actually did introduce the super jump and the rolling away after you get attacked, but other than that, yeah, it's a pretty standard affair. You've got all your attacks, you've got a super attack which is X-Men themed, and really that's what I'd say about the game, is it feels kind of like Darkstalkers with an X-Men theme over it. There's 10 characters to choose from, which is, you know, not the largest, but it's mostly iconic X-Men characters. And the story is based on the Fatal Attraction story from the comics. Presentation-wise, it's got that Capcom 90s flair, it does look a bit comic booky, and I think it still has aged alright. The music, a bit forgettable, but the game has a decent aesthetic overall. I don't hear all that many people talk about this game anymore, and that's because it's just kind of been blown out of the water by MVC, and yeah, I'd rather play MVC than this, but what you have here is a decent little game that I think fans of X-Men or Marvel or Marvel vs. Capcom can enjoy. The games have gotten a lot better since this original one, it doesn't reinvent the wheel, it doesn't really have a lot of content, and the roster is a little small, but it's still a fun little time. And so here we have the follow-up, Marvel Super Heroes releasing in 1995. Now this game is very similar to X-Men Children of the Atom, only instead of being X-Men focused, it's Marvel as a whole. There are still X-Men characters here, but a bunch of Marvel characters have joined the fray, like Spider-Man, Captain America, Hulk, Iron Man, Doctor Doom, and even Thanos is here. The roster, yeah, I like the overall Marvel roster versus just focusing on X-Men, I think that's cool. And I think the roster is generally stronger. Now when it comes to the gameplay, it is incredibly similar to the X-Men fighting game. It plays very similarly, it feels almost the same, very similar to Darkstalkers. In fact, characters like Wolverine who were in the X-Men game basically feel and play identical to how he did in the previous one. I mean, graphically, I could pretty much say the same thing. It looks almost the same as the previous game, Wolverine. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just like the same animation that's even here. It looks still good, still looks like a comic book coming to life, and I still think it has a nice aesthetic, but yeah, very, very similar to the previous one. At least when it comes to the premise and the story, it is different from the X-Men game. It's this little storyline that nobody ever cared about called the Infinity Gauntlet storyline. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's not really a big deal or anything. But this small storyline that nobody would ever care about in the future does actually have a gameplay purpose as well. It has this unique mechanic where you can actually use these infinity gems, the power, time, space, reality, soul, and mind gems. These gems can be earned from obtaining them from opponents during the arcade mode or by fulfilling certain criteria during the versus mode, such as getting the first hit. You can use these gems actually in the battle to receive enhanced effects for a short amount of time such as increased power or defense, health, recovery, or additional attacks. Some characters even have unique combinations with certain gems like Spider-Man being able to create a doppelganger of himself. These gems, it's actually pretty unique and I like them better implemented in this game than Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite which is funny. Like, they don't have a huge, massive impact on the fight. Obviously, it is a helpful tool that you have at your disposal, but it's not a make-or-break situation. If you use it and the other opponent doesn't have it, it doesn't mean it's the end for them. I think it's a decent little addition, and it's a unique mechanic that allows this game to stand differently from that X-Men game. It actually gives it an identity, and it's, again, something unique. Does it really change all that much? No, and it doesn't really allow me to recommend this game much further than if you like Marvel, if you like Marvel vs. Capcom, you should probably go play those games. But if you're looking for something older or Marvel-specific, I mean, you could do a hell of a lot worse with Marvel games. And so here we have X-Men vs. Street Fighter releasing originally in 96. Now this game really is the follow-up to both of those Marvel fighting games and throws Street Fighter into the mix. And this is really when the Marvel vs. Capcom series got started. This was obviously a much smaller scale than all of Marvel vs. all of Capcom, but it still is that same idea of it being just a crazy crossover with a bunch of combos and teams and, and that fast-paced gameplay that the series really has become iconic for. Anything resembling a plot or a premise or anything like that, yeah, that, that's gone. We don't really need a reason as to why the X-Men are fighting Street Fighter characters though, do we? When it comes to the roster, we have 17 characters. You know, not the strongest in terms of number, but it's still a decent little roster with some of the fan favorites on the Street Fighter side and some good, iconic X-Men characters like Wolverine, Sabretooth, Magneto, Juggernaut, etc. Look, the roster had to start somewhere. We couldn't just start with these massive 30, 40, 50 people rosters. We had to start somewhere. We started small here. What we have, it's totally fine. 
when it comes to the sprites and general graphics, it's pretty obvious these are all reused from previous Capcom games. The X-Men characters are from X-Men Children of Adam, and Street Fighter, it looks like they're from Street Fighter Alpha 2. At the very least, they actually all blend together and it does look cohesive and nice, and the game does have a good aesthetic that still matches the Marvel comic book aesthetic that I think looks nice even nowadays. It's easy on the eyes and it's easy to understand nowadays. And the same can be said for the gameplay. It's easy to pick up and play, easy to understand. If you've ever played a fighting game, you'll be able to pick this game up just fine. It's not super stiff, it's actually pretty smooth. You'll be doing combos left and right, it actually has a nice feel to it, it's satisfying, and if you've ever played any Street Fighter, or Darkstalkers, or any Marvel vs. Capcom, you're gonna have zero issues here. Sure, it's not as in-depth as some of the other games I just mentioned, but you're still gonna be having fun with it, and that's absolutely what matters. This game introduced the team format, so you actually pick two characters, and the goal is to defeat the two characters on each team. Rather than winning both rounds, you really do just have to defeat both characters, and you can tag in and out during the middle of the match, which is always going to be a good time, and if you tag someone out after they recently took some damage, they can actually heal a little bit back. But the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is very similar to, say, Marvel superheroes. This game did introduce the Hyper Combo Gauge, though, which would go on to be in, like, all the other Marvel vs. Capcom games, and the gameplay... Yeah, it's a good time. I don't really have a ton to say about it because it plays really similar to Marvel vs. Capcom. It just feels a little more scaled down. And the series would only get better from here. Speaking of, here we have Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter releasing in 97. Now, if you thought X-Men vs. Street Fighter was similar to Marvel vs. Capcom, now it's really similar to Marvel vs. Capcom. It really is just one step away from MVC. The gameplay, the aesthetics, really almost everything is basically the same as X-Men vs. Street Fighter. It's just the characters are a little different here. We have 17 playable characters again, and on the Capcom side, the Street Fighter side, it's basically exactly the same. On the Marvel side, there's Blackheart, Captain America, Cyclops, Hulk, Omega Red, Shuma Korth, Spider-Man, and Wolverine. This was the game that actually introduced Omega Red to me, who I'm very excited to see in upcoming games. When it comes to the character roster, yeah, it's the same number as the previous game, but I think it is a little stronger since it's all of Marvel versus just X-Men. That's probably the wrong word. It's all of Marvel rather than just X-Men. There, that sounds nicer. It's fine for what it is. When it comes to the gameplay, though, I really don't have like anything to say. If you've played any Capcom fighting game from the 90s, you'll be able to pick this one up and understand it. It is really, really similar to X-Men vs. Street Fighter. And if you like that game, you're gonna like this game. I like this game just a tiny bit more because of the roster, and that's really it. Both of them are good games. They aren't anything all that special, especially because of Marvel vs. Capcom, but they're still solid enough fighting games. And so here we have Capcom vs. SNK Millennium Fight 2000, releasing for the Dreamcast in, as the title implies, 2000. So this is the second game in the Capcom vs. SNK series, but it was the first fighting game in said series. Now honestly, it doesn't take a data scientist to see Capcom fighting SNK characters, it's just a dream scenario and it should be an instant moneymaker. These two companies really were the main two fighting game companies of the 90s. Like, most fighting games were either by Capcom or SNK. There was obviously, you know, like Mortal Kombat and some one-offs, but it was usually Capcom or SNK, and so to have them coming together to fight, it's awesome. The game, I think, has a story, but it's kind of just that generic, you know, big tournament, everyone comes together to fight each other. It's really just a setup to have all these characters come together to fight each other. And, you know, speaking of characters, we got a decent roster here. On the Capcom side, it's pretty much all Street Fighter outside of Morgan. And then on the SNK side, it's pretty much all of King of Fighters outside a couple characters from Art of Fighting and Samurai Showdown. I personally would have liked to have seen maybe some other series represented here, but you know, we've got a lot of the core characters at least. This game's sequel would certainly improve the roster, but you know, we have a decent little start here with the roster, and I think that there's a good mix of some of the fan favorites and some interesting choices. At least all the characters really are under a more unified art style. Everybody looks decently similar. Nobody looks super out of place here or like they're from one of the older games and just copied and pasted in. In fact, the presentation is pretty solid as a whole. There's some really good sprite work here. And the music is just as solid with a bunch of fan favorite tracks from Capcom and SNK. Like when I heard Terry's theme play, I was like, oh snap, this is a good one. The presentation, yeah, 
is pretty solid. Now when it comes to the actual core gameplay, that moment to moment gameplay, it's a mix of, you know, Capcom and SNK. It uses the SNK 4 button style format versus, you know, like Street Fighter 6 button, but if you've played as any of these Capcom characters, you'll feel decently at home here with them. And if you've played any of the SNK characters, you're really going to feel at home here. But actually, how is the fighting? Is it easy to pick up and play, or is it just so stiff and unplayable in 2023 or whenever you're playing this in the future? Well, I think it's still very playable. It is a little stiffer and it is a bit harder to master since it is more on the SNK side generally with the fighting, which has always been a bit stiffer and just more methodical with some just truly crazy ass inputs. So I don't think it's as easy to pick up and play as say Marvel vs. Capcom. You're not gonna pick this game up and start doing these crazy ultra combos or anything like that. But you're gonna pick this game up and you're not gonna feel too far from home. It's still gonna feel relatively familiar and it's not gonna be stiff as shit. I think it strikes a mostly nice enough balance here. I was able to pick it up and have some fun, so there's that at least. This game does have a very interesting system when it comes to its character selections though. It has the ratio system. So in this game, all of the characters have a rating ranging from 1 to 4. You can actually build a team of characters up to 4, but their combined ratio must equal or go no higher than 4. So if say you want Ryu and Ken on a team, each of them are 2. So you'll be a team of 2, but you could choose say 4 tier 1 characters, then you've got a team of 4. And no, having more fighters does not give you some crazy awesome advantage or anything like that. The game does try to balance it out a bit. This system, it's alright. I don't know if it's the best system for a game like this. I mean, the second game would totally change this up, but it's an interesting system, no doubt. And it actually incentivized me to use characters I wouldn't normally pick. Like, for instance, I might go, you know what, I guess I'll give that tier 1 character a shot. I got some room. Oh, I got room for two of them. Hey, I'll try. I'll try two characters I don't really play. So that was fun, at least. I got to try some characters I don't normally play. And then there's also the groove system. The SNK groove is based on the extra mode that was used in King of Fighters 94 to 98, while Capcom's is based on the Street Fighter Alpha series. This is just kind of almost standard fighting game stuff. But all of this comes together to create a pretty decent fighter. This game does feel pretty similar to Maul vs. Capcom in the sense that this original first game, they were just getting started, they were, you know, dipping their toe in the water, seeing how things were, and it's really that second game where it absolutely took off and everybody loved it, but the original Capcom vs. SNK, I still think it is a pretty decent, pretty fun time. And here we have the original Street Fighter Alpha, releasing all the way back in 95. Now, Alpha was actually the first all-new Street Fighter game produced by Capcom since the release of Street Fighter 2, and you know, it definitely had a lot riding on it, but Alpha, Alpha absolutely kicks ass. The game takes place in between Street Fighter 1 and 2 and features younger versions of some of our favorite characters and of course the introduction of some new characters. This game has 13 characters, obviously some of the mainstays are here, Ryu, Ken, Guile, Chun-Li, Sagat, but also Birdie and Adon coming over from the original Street Fighter, but in an interesting note, Guy, one of the characters from Final Fight along with Saddam show up here and then there's two new characters, Charlie and Rose. You know, the roster, it's okay. Obviously, the other alphas have a lot bigger and stronger rosters, but, you know, for the first one, yeah, it's alright. Something you can immediately see is that the art style for this game is different from Street Fighter 2. It's a lot more like Darkstalkers and X-Men Children of the Atom, and I think it looks great. The sprites are really great, the presentation as a whole is solid, and the soundtrack, yeah, alphas always got some bangers. But this is a fighting game, not a fighting soundtrack, so how is the gameplay, how is the fighting? This game, it actually is pretty easy to come back and play. You know, if you've played Street Fighter 2 really in any capacity, you'll be able to pick this up just fine. It's the most similar to Street Fighter 2, but there are some key differences here. The super combo system that was in Street Fighter 2 is a bit different here. Now it's got three levels to it, and as the player performs regular and special techniques, you know, it fills up. And the higher the level, the more damage and attacks you'll pull off. In addition to the super combos, the player can actually also perform the special counterattack technique called the Alpha Counter after blocking an opponent's attack, which will use up some of the super combo gauge. This game also introduced a few other techniques like air blocking and chain combos, which are these combos that are performed by interrupting the animation of one basic move by performing another of equal or greater strength. These are all good additions. All of this really does come together to make Alpha a solid fighter. The mechanics that this game introduced are not huge, they're not game changers, they're not going to change the fundamentals of Street Fighter, they just add on what's already there. Like if you like Street Fighter, you're going to like the fighting of this game, you're going to like Alpha. All these mechanics just add a bit more depth to the fighting itself, and these mechanics are not that hard to understand, especially if you've played any modern fighting games. 
And if you've played any modern fighting games, you won't really have much trouble coming back and playing this one. Like, it doesn't feel stiff, it feels very nice, it's easy to just pick up and understand. And so with all that, I think this game is worth playing. Obviously, the other alphas improved on this game a lot, especially the roster, but the original alpha, yeah, it's still a good game, and it's still a fun little fighting game. And here we have the original Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of the Superheroes, initially releasing in 98. Now, while there might have been Street Fighter vs. Marvel Super Heroes and X-Men, this was the first, like, proper MVC game. This game, like the title implies, combined characters from not just Street Fighter and not just X-Men, but rather all of Marvel and all of Capcom. Now, when it comes to the characters, this game only has 15, which is less than X-Men vs. Marvel Super Heroes. But, I'm gonna give a big, nice, fat ass, thick butt here. The roster, I think, is way stronger. It's not dominated by just Street Fighter and X-Men characters. There's a nice mix here. Now when it comes to the moment to moment gameplay, this game plays incredibly similar to X-Men vs Street Fighter. It's a very similar speed, it feels pretty much the same, and yeah the characters have more moves and some new combos, but relatively speaking, yeah, it feels incredibly similar to X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter outside of the gems. The game also gets rid of the variable assist from the previous game and instead is this kind of like guest character summoning where before each match you can choose a guest to join you and you can summon them to help you. None of these guests are playable characters either. Most of these guests would end up being playable characters at some point in the series though. Another addition this game has over the previous two is it's the game to actually introduce the duo team attack which is where both characters on your team, because you still have teams here, use their special attack at the same time, which would go on to be a fan favorite move of the whole MVC series. And so, you know, all of these little tweaks and changes, yeah, it makes it different from those previous two crossover games, and I think it's a lot better, it's a lot more fun, and these changes make it just a lot more hectic. More, 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 that's really what this game has, more. Look, I'm not going to act like this is some monumental improvement over Marvel Super Heroes vs. X-Men, but I think it is a decent enough improvement on it to the point where I still think the game is absolutely worth trying. Now, does Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and 3 really, and I mean really, improve on this game? Absolutely, but this game is no slouch either, and I think it's still one of the better Capcom fighting games from the 90s. And if you couldn't guess, there's a lot of those, so for me to say that, yeah, this game kicks some ass and I got some good memories with it, so maybe that's propping it up a little bit, but I think if you like fighting games, if you like MVC, then this game is totally worth playing. It's a shame that it was delisted a while back. It, it did have an Xbox Live and PSN release with like online play and everything, which was pretty cool, but I don't think that's available anymore. And so here we have Gotcha Force releasing for the GameCube in 2003. Now, Gotcha Force, it's really unique. It is a fighting game, but also a third-person shooter. In fact, I very loosely consider this a fighting game. It is just barely a fighting game. It's mostly a third-person shooter. I'd say if I had to compare this game to anything, it would be Custom Robo. That would probably be the most accurate comparison. Or maybe those newer Gundam games, but don't quote me on that. I'm not super familiar with newer Gundam video games. But yeah, the main gameplay, it is as follows. You'll pick which gotchas you want to put on your task force, basically, and then you get into a fight with other gotcha Borgs. There are obviously some limits put in place, so you don't just have the stupid OP Borgs the entire time, but really it's your team up against the enemy team. You're constantly engaging in battle, shooting at each other, using melee weapons to take each other out. Really, win by any means necessary. The game certainly has a unique feel to it, especially compared to other Capcom fighting games. It's actually from a third-person perspective. You know, you can dodge you can heal, you can shoot, you can block, there's special abilities depending on which gacha you choose. And these aren't simple one-on-one -on -one battles, usually the other team has a couple different Borgs that you gotta take out, you also have a few Borgs at your disposal, and some of these battles can last upwards of, you know, 5-10 to 10 minutes, it's not the fastest fighting game, but I think this gameplay is actually enjoyable. This game actually does feel rather unique, even in today's day and age. Like, it just doesn't feel like there's many games that play like this. There's actually over 200 different Borgs in the game, so there's always going to be something different going on, and no two matches really ever play the same. Is it the most complex game? Does it have a ton of depth? Are you going to be learning its systems for hours and hours? No, it doesn't have that. But what you do have is an incredibly fun shooter where you're just trying to take out as many of the Borgs as possible. The game has a unique aesthetic and it has some really Capcom-ass music. Like, the music sounds very much like Mega Man in other Capcom titles and it slaps. It's actually really good. 
the game does have an actual like story mode to it as well it's not just a bunch of random matches there's like a map and everything and the game does have a real plot sure there's not exactly a lot to it but you know what it gets the ball rolling and it's good to see that this game has a full length story mode this isn't like an hour or two either this is well over eight to ten hours and yeah it's actually a great time the game also of course has multiplayer i've never really messed around with the multiplayer but i've seen plenty of people talking good stuff about the multiplayer of gotcha force when Gotcha Force came out, a lot of people didn't really care for it, like at all. People were like, this is too mindless, it seems just kind of eh. But as time went on, people actually really took to this game, and it's become a cult classic. It's also become stupidly expensive. It's one of the most expensive games, not only for the GameCube, but in general. I see it regularly over four or five hundred dollars. And so, is it worth that? No. No game is worth that. This game, it's not the most advanced. It can get a bit repetitive. And while fun, it isn't exactly one of the most deep or rewarding experiences you'll find even on the GameCube from Capcom. But this game has heart, it has charm, it has good music, it's got solid enough gameplay, you can have some fun in the multiplayer, and it's free to download online, which is how I recommend you try it, if you're going to try this game. This game desperately needs a re-release, especially with online play, like that would be awesome, and I think Capcom could totally start another franchise up with this one, you just gotta give it a chance, please re-release this one this one deserves to be re-released it's a good one and i think that it is worth trying you know just not for a couple hundred dollars and so here we have street fighter 5 originally releasing in 2015 and if i rank these games based on when they originally released oh boy street fighter 5 it might be like at the bottom of the list because i was pissed you all know it, but I'm going to reiterate it anyway. The launch was terrible. I got this game, yeah, at launch date and went, what is this shit? I played the game for a few days of the launch week and I didn't touch it again for years. I was just so disappointed and unhappy with that original release that I was like, no, I'm not touching this for years. And I can tell you now, years later, the game actually is pretty decent to good, has a lot of content and has a number of good things going for it. But yeah that launch just kind of soured me on this game permanently. So years after the release, the game actually did get a story. It takes place in between Street Fighter 4 and 3 and has Bison being, you know, just kind of an asshole and then all the Street Fighter characters show up and I just never really care too much about the story in this game. They actually do have a single player like story mode and that is cool and all, but kind of too little too late it's not exactly that long either it's maybe like an hour or two there really just isn't a ton to it the game at least has an arcade mode it didn't even launch with that can you tell i'm still salty about the launch like i really am still salty about the launch they really launched it with like training mode and a broken online they didn't even have arcade mode you could do like local multiplayer and that's really it but now it has training arcade mode the challenges and online mode that might work i haven't tried it in a while a story mode and a much better cast of characters when the game launched it had 16 characters and i mean it was a decent base roster it wasn't great but it was okay it's gotten much much better with all the seasons and a bunch of the fan favorites are here but i know there are plenty of people that went oh i don't care about the modes or anything like that i just want to know how the fighting itself is i mean the fighting is good the fighting was always good in street fighter 5 i mean i didn't love it compared to say 4 but i thought the fighting was always good here it's still pretty smooth it feels nice there's a lot of satisfying elements to it, and I do have some fond memories now with Street Fighter V playing with some friends, but I certainly didn't those first couple of years. Something new to this game is that they have the V gauge, and they have the V skills. These, I'm a bit more mixed on. I was never huge on them. I don't really think Street Fighter needed this gimmick, and I don't know how much it really added to the gameplay from a casual perspective. I'm sure, you know, on the professional level, this probably changes shit like crazy, but I don't know. I just never really cared too much for it. But like I said, it still has that Street Fighter gameplay. You know, if you've played like any of the games before this one, you'll be able to pick this one up and have a ton of fun still. Kick some ass, whoop some butt, you know, whatever you want to do. You can still do it here and you can still have a good time. Did I have as much fun with this game as I have the other Street Fighters that are higher on this list? No, I didn't. Did the launch really just kind of give me an incredibly sour bias that I'm going to take to the grave. Yeah, it really did. Something else I'm going to throw out there is I hated this game's aesthetic when it came out. I thought it looked so vanilla and plain and just basic. And I was like, really, this is the best they could do. And the music was like, all right, it wasn't amazing, like Street Fighter Third Strike or two. And I don't like the character design in this game. I don't really like how they look, especially Ken. What did they do to Ken? 
I don't know, the aesthetics, presentation, music just didn't do it for me. This game doesn't do it for me in a number of ways, but I can see all these years later it's gotten quite a bit better than it originally was, and it still does have some fun. If you love Street Fighter, you're gonna like the game, but at this current point in time, I don't really think it's worth playing, especially with Street Fighter 6 out, but you know, if you want to go back a couple years, you got Street Fighter 5 here. And here we have Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge releasing in arcades in 95. This is the follow-up to the original Darkstalkers. Now despite it being a follow-up, it actually has the exact same plot and even endings as the first game where Pyron invades Earth to add it to his collection of planets he devoured and the world's most fearsome monsters are the last line of defense. So when it comes to its character roster, just about everybody returns here, so you've got a decent start. And it lets you play as the two bosses from the first game, so Pyron and then Hoitzel. I'm probably saying that wrong. And then it also introduces two new characters, Donovan, who's awesome, and then Heisenko. Probably not saying that right either. Now, despite the difficult to pronounce names, these are some of the more iconic characters from Darkstalkers that have appeared in other Capcom fighting games, and I quite like them here also. Now, when it comes to the actual fighting gameplay, it is pretty similar to the first game in a number of different aspects. I will say it feels a bit slower, it, it, at least it felt slower to me. I cannot confirm this with like hard data, but it felt a bit slower, and it feels a bit floatier. And then there are several other tweaks and changes to the formula from the first game. Some of these include the introduction of chain combos, and players can actually choose between a normal gameplay style or one that has auto-blocking. I'm not a fan of auto-blocking in any game, so I don't know why this is here. But the biggest change by far has to be the ability for the player to stock up on their special gauge, allowing them to actually store more than one special gauge and preserve them through the entire match. So here you can actually store them up and there's two special attacks, there's the ES special which uses some of the bar and the EX special which actually requires an entire stock of the special gauge and this would go on to be in other Street Fighter games as well. So you know, it got its start way back here and I actually like this implemented system, I think that it adds some strategy here and some depth. And when it comes to depth, it seems like there's a lot more here than the first game. I mean, just the addition of chain combos really adds a lot to that. And then, you know, the whole special gauge stuff. Some of the characters have also been tweaked a bit. Not everyone is exactly the same. Some characters, you know, have some new moves, have been updated, nerf, buff, etc. You know, what you expect from a fighting game. Visually, the game looks really similar to the first game. It still looks great. It has a ton of personality and style and charm, and the music's great. It animates great. There's a ton of frames of animation here, so sometimes it just goes nuts, but I generally like the aesthetics here, and I think the game still looks pretty good. It still holds up gameplay-wise also, just like the first one. It's still a fun time. Have had some fun in the multiplayer. Should you play this over the first game? I mean, I would say it's a little better than the first game. And you can actually check it out on modern hardware with the Capcom Fighting Collection. There was also Vampire Hunter 2, which was basically an updated version of Vampire Hunter mixed with Vampire Savior, but this is actually an inferior version to the original, at least I believe so. There are probably videos that are 10-20 minutes long getting knee-deep into all the technical aspects as to why Vampire Hunter 2 is not as good as the original Vampire. But I'm going to just keep it pretty casual and say that there's a number of changes here and some character roster changes that I'm not a big fan of. And I think if you're going to play a Vampire Hunter, you should play just the original Vampire Hunter. It seems to be what the community plays as well, and I will leave it at that. But Vampire Hunter, it's pretty solid fighting game. And so here we have Tech Romancer releasing for the Dreamcast in 2000. Now when it comes to Capcom fighting games, Tech Romancer is one of their most unique. They really have nothing else that plays like this game. It kind of feels almost like they made a 3D version of Cyberbots, but then threw in a bunch of other crazy shit. The game takes place in the far, far future of Earth, where advanced technology have made things calm and decent for the citizens of Japan, but the peace doesn't last because this is a video game and an evil alien tyrant named Goldie Bus, yes really, invades the planet with his loyal followers and seeks to conquer the world while enslaving the human race with an emotionless iron fist. And so a group of heroes band together with their own giant mechas to take on this alien. The story, the premise really, it's just a means to the end. It's there just to set up the fighting, and fighting is all you do in this game. So this game is a 3D fighting game that involves a bunch of big mech. It's clear they took a lot of inspiration from, say, Gundam. I mean, Gundam had been around over a decade at this point in Japan, so yeah, they had plenty of source material. In terms of the characters and really the design, they all have unique designs and they all look really different. They all have different types of robots, and it's actually a quite varied cast. 
Now let's get into the fighting itself. I think the fighting in this game actually is pretty decent to good. It's aged well, it's easier to pick up and play than some of these other 3D fighting games, and it feels nice. It's also really satisfying, you know, these are giant hulking creatures and mechs beating the shit out of each other. You want it to feel heavy and big. With these being big heavy mechs, you don't want the game to be moving at supersonic speed, and it doesn't. I think the pacing is still good though, it does have a decent speed to it, and you'll be following up on your attacks quite often, chasing after the opponent. Something that's unique is as you're brawling in these environments, sometimes buildings and other terrain features will show up, and you can actually just totally destroy these or use them to your advantage. And usually when they're destroyed, they'll drop a power-up. This is just like the Godzilla games that would come out a bit later on the GameCube and PS2 and Xbox. I ranked all the Godzilla fighting games as well, so shout out there. But yeah, I think the fighting is nice. You know, each mech does have some super attacks as well as a final attack, which is usable when the opponent is down to the last 50% of their second life bar. See, this game has two life bars rather than two rounds, and whoever loses both of their life bars, you know, they're the loser, wah wah. When it comes to what you'll be doing in this game outside of the fighting, there's actually two modes. There's the story mode and the hero challenge mode. The hero challenge mode is more of your traditional arcade style mode, you know, where you just kind of go through a bunch of fights. The story mode is actually pretty sick. Like, each character has their own unique story, and it plays out like an anime series, with each battle broken up by an episode title, an eye catch, and a dialogue scene before and after the battle. There's actually some choices here. There's dialogue choices, and depending on how you finish the fight, it might affect the path you're on for the story. There's actually multiple endings for these characters, which, yeah, that's not exactly the most common in fighting games. I think it's a really unique touch, and it adds a lot of replayability. This game actually does have a decent amount of replayability, not just with the single player, but of course the multiplayer. This game's just a blast in the multiplayer, you know, it's a bunch of big hulking shit beating the shit out of each other. How could you not like that? The game's got a pretty good presentation for the Dreamcast, it's got nice music in it, there's not a ton to dislike here. Is it the most complex or advanced fighter? Absolutely not. But is it big, dumb, fun, literally big and dumb? Yes, it is both of those. And I totally do think it is worth trying. And here we have Street Fighter X Tekken releasing in 2012. Now, I was there day one for this game. You know, I love Tekken. I really do love Tekken. I've ranked all the Tekkens on the channel, and I like Street Fighter, so I was like, this game seemed totally up my alley, and you know, while I did enjoy it back then, I can see nowadays, it does have some issues, but it was still a really fun time. So like the title implies, this is Street Fighter crossing over with the Tekken series, the 3D Tekken series, I might add. So this game plays much more like Street Fighter. It's two-dimensional and all of the Tekken characters really have been converted to play in 2D as Tekken is a very much 3D series with its animation, movement, and just moves in general. And honestly, I think it is crazy how well so many of these Tekken characters converted to 2D and how well they play in this game. Some of my favorite Tekken characters like Kuma or Christy are still awesome in this game. I can still do combos that I would do in Tekken and they work in this game in a totally different setting. I think that's really impressive and deserves a bunch of praise. And then of course you've got all the Street Fighter characters which play more like, you know, regular Street Fighter characters. Now on the subject of characters, this game's character roster goes absolutely nuts. Like this is one of the biggest character rosters I've ever seen for a fighting game that doesn't have the word Dragon Ball in it. There's like 50 characters here and if you're playing the PS3 version, there's some exclusives like Cole McGrath, Kuro and Toro, Mega Man, which is the US box art Mega Man, yeah it's, it's fucking stupid, and Pac-Man from the Ghostly Adventures, the other fucking stupid series, and Pac-Man's in a mech, but whatever, there's a ton of characters. When it comes to the Street Fighter and the Tekken characters, they have so many of the fan favorites, like, it's nothing but great. I really have nothing but good things to say about the roster. I absolutely do remember all the controversy though when this game came out that the DLC was already on the disc and they were charging you extra for it, which I still think is absolutely ridiculous. But nowadays it feels like the opposite, barely any of the game is on the disc and you just gotta download the rest of it, so I guess times have changed. But yeah, that DLC controversy, it was pretty ridiculous at Capcom to do that and it's always gonna hurt the roster a little for me, it's always gonna hurt this game a little for me, but the roster, it's pretty freaking amazing. Now a great roster, it doesn't mean shit if the gameplay sucks. Now I already said that all the Tekken characters really translate very well to 2D and they feel really nice to control. The Street Fighter characters are the same thing really, that's great to control. But this game in general, it actually feels really nice, it's satisfying, it's easy to pick up and play. It's got all those key elements you're looking for in a more modern fighting game and if you've played any fighting game in the last 10 years, you'll be able to play this game just fine.
The game has a really heavy emphasis on the tag team mechanic. It's much more like Tekken's tag team mechanic where if one of the players gets knocked out then they lose the round and whoever wins two rounds wins. And in this game there's a bunch of different tag mechanics you can do more than say Street Fighter EX3. It's pretty awesome. I like the tag element of this game and I like how this game deals with its supers and the cross gauge. And I think the mechanics overall were just really solid. I think the fighting was actually really solid in this game. But you know what wasn't really solid? The gem system and the Pandora mode. I never liked either of these. These gems, I thought they were just stupid when it came out. I think it's stupid now. I don't like the gems. I don't like how they're implemented. I don't like what they do. I don't like the Pandora mode either. I'd rather just have neither of these in the game, to be honest. I think without either of these and that DLC on the disc bullshit, and the game would have gotten even more praise. I think people would still really be talking about it nowadays because I think the fighting's great, the roster's great, the presentation is excellent, there's a ton of fan service, I think it's got a bunch of unique ideas, and it is just an absolute ton of fun. Like, I've never not had a bunch of fun while playing the game because I love Tekken. I like Street Fighter. I mean, it just works. Like, it just absolutely works. And it's a shame that the game isn't really talked about very much these days. Would I argue the game's underrated? I don't know about that, but I do think that if you like either of these series, this game is worth checking out. It is really cheap nowadays, so that's a big plus. It doesn't seem like we're ever getting the Tekken version, Tekken X Street Fighter, so... I guess we just have this one to go off of at least. Hey, at least it's a good game. And here we have the Forgotten Cyberbots Full Metal Madness releasing back in 95. So this game is actually a spin-off from another Capcom title, Armored Warriors, which was a beat-em-up. But it's not like you need to play that game to understand or enjoy this game, because Cyberbots, oh, Cyberbots is a real good time. And so what really is this game? Well, it has you playing as these just giant robots destroying absolutely everything. You know, there is a story in there and there's even some characters and dialogue, but really, yeah, it's about these giant robots destroying everything. So there's a number of characters in this game, but the character you pick doesn't seem to matter all that much. It's all about the mecha you choose. The game does have a few different mechs you can choose and they're all relatively different from each other. They have really cool designs. Like some of these look fucking awesome and are still some of the coolest looking mechs I've seen in any game outside of like Armored Core. So yeah, the mechs look really cool and there's a good amount of different ones you can choose. When it comes to the fighting, this game is pretty fast and it feels really nice actually. Even to this day, it wasn't mad stiff, it was really smooth, nice to pick up and play. And the game just had a nice feel to it, despite being relatively fast and being in these giant mechs, like the attacks you're doing still feel really heavy and it feels like you're doing some devastating shit. You're cleaning house up in here. Look, the fighting is a bit button mashy. The combos aren't anything too extravagant or crazy. And a lot of the time I was just spamming super moves than doing actually like any combos or strings. But it still felt really satisfying. And above all else, I was having fun. All the robots, they feel quite different from each other with a bunch of different gadgets like the lasers, drills, these electricity. Some of these robots go absolutely crazy like they go freaking nuts with some of these moves and it's really cool to see the game has you know the typical arcade kind of story mode but i mostly really like 90 percent of the time was just messing around with the multiplayer in this one because it was it was fun it was actually really fun and we went from just playing for like 10 20 minutes to playing like two or three hours because we were just having a bunch of fun look there's not a ton of depth with this one i don't know if you'll be coming back you know a few years from now after you play it or anything but if you're looking for some flashy fun that just goes absolutely nuts i think cyberbots is one of the best capcom fighting games for that yeah, it's a fun time. It's it's certainly fun. And so here we have Street Fighter Alpha 2 releasing originally in 96. Now Alpha 2, what it really is, is a remake of the original Alpha, but it features a ton of new improvements over the original, such as new characters, attacks, stages, and a bunch of gameplay features, to the point where, yeah, I think it deserves its own entry on the list. So when it comes to the character roster, it has the 13 characters from the original game, but it has some characters coming over from Street Fighter 2, specifically Dalism and Zangief. It has Gen from the original Street Fighter, Rolento who was in Final Fight, now is a Street Fighter character, and this game has the newcomer Sakura, who would go on to be a fan favorite in the Street Fighter series. Now it's pretty clear already, but the roster is quite a bit better than the original game. I think it's actually more than solid enough, and it's arguably better than even Street Fighter 2's roster. So when it comes to the gameplay, I mean, it's obviously going to be very similar to the original Alpha. It is just kind of a remake of the original Alpha, but there are some key differences. The main new feature of this game is the inclusion of the custom combo system, which replaces those chain combos from the first Alpha. Everything else, though, from the first Alpha is still here, like air blocking. 
The custom combo system though, it adds even more depth to this fighting that the chain combo system from the first game didn't have. And I won't lie with y'all, it starts to get pretty technical here, it starts to go over my head. The depth, it's real here with this one. But the gameplay is actually really solid. There are a lot of people who still really love Alpha 2 and play this even over Alpha 3 and there's a reason because Alpha 2, it still whoops ass. It's still a really good game, it's got a good roster, it's still really satisfying, it's easy to pick up and play but the game absolutely has depth and legs and is not only a great Street Fighter game but it's just a great fighting game in general that I have no problem recommending especially if you like Street Fighter or the first Alpha I totally think it's worth playing it is better than the original Alpha it kind of makes the original Alpha low-key obsolete I mean the game looks better it runs better it's got more depth more characters the music still slaps and I really got no problem recommending this game to any fighting game fans and here we have Rival Schools United by Fate releasing originally in 97, but for the PS1 in 98. Now, Rival Schools, now I know there aren't exactly a lot of people talking about Rival Schools these days, but this game, it absolutely kicks some ass, and it's one of Capcom's most unique, interesting fighting games that they've ever made that I think absolutely should come back in today's day and age. So, for the uninitiated, Rival Schools does take place in the Street Fighter universe. It takes place in this Japanese city where several local schools are victims of unknown attacks and kidnapping of students and staff and so it's up to our characters to put a stop to it. This game actually does try to have a little bit more story and plot than most Capcom fighting games and I think it's actually rather decent. I think the world is interesting. I mean it's in Street Fighter's world. It's going to be kind of interesting by default but I think the world is interesting in this game. The characters are actually interesting and different and I like the premise. And of course, depending on the characters you choose, you get different endings, yada yada yada. Speaking of the characters, we got a really interesting cast of characters here. Not only do they all visually look pretty different from each other, but they also play very differently from each other for the most part. Sakura is here from Street Fighter, but she is the only recognizable face. Everyone else is new and again feels relatively different. So when it comes to the gameplay, the game is best described as a 3D Marvel vs. Capcom game with some differences. When it comes to the controls, it's much more like Star Gladiator with two punches and two kicks, similar to I guess an SNK game. But this game does have a few additions that make it feel different from Star Gladiator or Soul Calibur or any of those other 3D fighting games. See it does have launchers like the MVC games and you can actually do a bunch of air combos here. And then this game has a few defense techniques. It has this thing called the tardy counters, which are very similar to Street Fighter Alpha's counters, but it's certainly not as punishing as Street Fighter Alpha's counters can be, and it's not as difficult to pull off. And then there's also the attack cancels, which allows a player to cancel any incoming hit simply by timing their own hit with the attack, which would cancel out both attacks. And it will actually give you a whole meter. This game has a meter that goes up to nine levels, which is quite a bit. And then it also has this really interesting mechanic known as the team up see when you choose a character you actually choose two characters but in the fights themselves it's only one on one the other character is like a summon where you can do a double team attack or maybe some special ability it does use up a level though and all of this comes together to create one of the better 3D fighting games made by Capcom. There's actually a little bit of depth here. It isn't just a total button masher. There is obviously a bunch of button mashing here, but yeah, there's actually a little strategy, a little depth, and it gets really chaotic, and it's quite fun. I'd much rather play this game over either of the Star Gladiator games, and I've never not had a fun time with this one. Like, the unique character roster, the unique aesthetic, the good presentation, the nice music, the depth, the fighting itself, yeah. This game, it's actually pretty solid, and I really do think that Rival Schools should come back. This game did get a Japanese-only re-release. It was like an update with a new character and some tweaks, but yeah, I've never tried that version. It was only in Japan. But, I mean, this was the first entry, and it's already this good. Who knows how good the series could have been, like, nowadays? If you haven't tried it yet, I think this might be a fighting game to put on your radar if you have any interest at all. And here we have JoJo's Bizarre Adventure releasing for the Dreamcast in 2000. Now JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, I won't lie to you, is probably like my favorite anime of all time that isn't Hamtaro and hopefully soon enough I'll have a list where I talk about all the JoJo games. If that's something you want to see, you let me know down below. And so I was naturally very inclined to like this game. Now, this game has a couple different versions of it, but I just kind of combined them all here for this one. And I'm just going off the PS1 Dreamcast version that was eventually re-released on Xbox 360 and PS3, but sadly it has been delisted. So JoJo, yeah, I don't think I really need to provide an intro for this one. It's one of the most popular mangas and animes legit of all time. 
The game is based off the most popular, in my opinion, best arc of the series, the Stardust Crusaders arc, so the game goes through the entire arc, and yeah, it's awesome. Like, it's just amazing. Like, the anime adaptation of this arc really just is must-see anime. But, that's enough about the source material. Let's talk about the game. The first thing you see is the aesthetic and the presentation, which I think are just excellent. The game kinda looks like Darkstalkers, but still looks very JoJo, and it looks absolutely in line with what you expect from JoJo these days. The game has a very unique look to it, and of course the music is gonna slap in this game, it's JoJo, but this is a fighting game, let's actually talk about the fighting for a second. So you have a variety of characters to choose from, there are 22 characters in the latest version, and this roster is just so cool, it has even like some of the lesser characters from the series, it doesn't just have like our main heroes, no it has a bunch of the villains too, it's really good stuff. Then we have the actual fighting, not to be too reductive, but it plays quite similar to Darkstalkers with the addition of the stands. Like when it comes to the actual feel and the combos and just how playing this game is, yeah, it's kind of similar to Darkstalkers. You know, you have your super, there's a bunch of combos, all that. The unique aspect of this game, and JoJo in general, is the stands. You can bring your stand out with the press of a button, and there's a couple bonuses to having the stands out, but there's also some risks. When you attack someone with the stand, you do more damage. There's actually some stand-specific moves and some combos that are, again, specific to the stand, but the stand can also actually take damage. It can be attacked, and it will hurt you. And using it too much, taking too much damage, can cause the stand to just temporarily disappear where you actually get stunned, and you can just get the shit beaten out of you. I think this is a pretty great way to implement stands into a JoJo game, like there's a risk versus reward aspect here just like the source material and it can really pay off or it can mess you up. It's really all about how you play your cards. Speaking of cards, there are some extra special stages here where you do some non-fighting game such as playing cards, and I think this is a great way to include the other stands that might not be so oriented for a fighting game. This game is really just a huge love letter to JoJo, and there's a ton of fan service. If you like JoJo and you haven't tried this game, I absolutely recommend it. If you're not really a fan of JoJo, it's still a decent fighting game. I know in recent years I've heard how just crazy unbalanced this game is, so maybe it's not the most competitive, but it's still a fun time, and I absolutely do recommend it. But fans of JoJo, oh, this is totally worth playing, have had plenty of good memories with this one as long as nobody's choosing pet shop pet shops just way too freaking good in this game but yeah totally worth recommending and so here we have project justice also known as rival schools 2 releasing for the dreamcast in 2001 so yeah this is the follow-up to rival schools it takes place one year after and sees this new mysterious group known as the reverse society setting their sights on our main family and plans to eliminate them and their allies and you know, we're just not gonna let that happen. The story's actually pretty cool and I like that it continues on from the original game and continues to actually have like a real ass story with characters. The setting and aesthetic still feel really unique and if they were doing all this back, you know, in like 2000, who knows what they could do nowadays, but Let's talk about the game. When it comes to the characters, almost every character comes over from the first game, with the exception of Raizo and Sakura, so kind of a shame that the one Street Fighter character is gone, but now we get to focus on the new characters. There are some new characters here, and even some alternate versions of a few existing characters. I think the roster is still really unique, and most of the characters feel relatively different from each other. So let's talk about that gameplay. The game's fighting system is really just lifted from the original Rival Schools with some changes. It still feels relatively smooth. It feels a little nicer than the first Rival Schools, and yeah, I actually think it feels really good. It's easy to pick up and understand, and you're not going to be struggling to get to grips with it. So let's talk about some of the changes from the first game. It still is a team fighter, but instead is teams of three characters rather than two. This allows another team up attack to be used in fight, but it also has a new type of attack, the party up, initiated by pressing any three attack buttons at the same time. And really, like this implies, it's a party up, all three characters attack. Kind of reminds me of like Persona's all out attack, but like in a fighting game sense. That additional partner also allows players to cancel an opponent's team up special by inputting a team up command of their own, which will initiate this like short fighting sequence between each character. And this adds a little bit of strategy, like you can totally stop someone in their tracks with this, which I actually think is rather cool. Another change is that the meter is down to 5 levels rather than the 9 that was in the original game, with party ups requiring all 5 levels. And with there being less levels, it really does add a little bit more strategy as to when you're going to use the team up moves or the party up moves. Like, I actually do like the strategy that's involved here. You don't want to just spam team moves the entire time like you could sometimes do in rival schools. 
I'd say there's about as much depth with this game as there was the first one. Like, yeah, it's not the most in-depth. There is obviously a little strategy, but it does still play relatively fast and kind of like 3D MVC with a bunch of air combos and just it being a bit button mashy. But hey, the fighting, it's still a good time, which is what's most important. Like, all the characters feel unique, and it's really cool still to see all the characters take their, like, fields of discipline and actually make movesets of it. It's just, it's really unique, and it hasn't really been seen in many other fighting games, if like any. Not to make another Persona reference, but Persona sure as hell doesn't do this, and that also involves students. Now I will give a shout out to the Japanese version of this game, it actually does have like a character creator which is really cool, unfortunately us in, over here in the west we don't, we don't get the privilege of having the character creator, but what we do have is the story mode and the free mode, both playing very similarly but the story mode having, you know, more story to it. Really what it comes down to is who you're choosing for your party. Overall I think that this game is absolutely solid, it is an improvement on the first game. I've had really just as much fun with this game as the first game. I would say that it's just slightly better. It controls a little better. It has more characters and it looks quite a bit better. Now this game along with many other games I've talked about today I think needs to be re-released. Like this game should be re-released on modern consoles with online play. I think it would absolutely slap and a ton of people would have fun with this game and a bunch of people who've never even heard of it would have a lot of fun. But as it currently stands, it's best played on Dreamcast, and I recommend anybody who likes fighting games to go check it out. And here we have Tatsunoko vs. Capcom Ultimate All-Stars, releasing for the Wii in 2010. This game was not developed by Capcom, but rather 18, and was published by Capcom. Now, I can very much remember when this game came out, people were saying that this was the best fighting game on the Wii. If it wasn't Super Smash Bros. Brawl, it was Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. And you know, all these years later, yeah, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. I couldn't exactly tell you how many fighting games are on the Wii that are good outside of this one in Brawl, but, you know, coming back many years later after this game came out, it still absolutely holds up and it still whoops some ass. Now, this was the first time I had ever heard of Tatsunoko. I legit just had never heard of them, and to be honest, I still don't really know much about Tatsunoko. I was just mostly here for the Capcom side. And hopefully there's a fun fighting game in there too, which there is. Now when it comes to the characters, there are 26 characters, 13 from each side. Uh, again, I'm not going to act like I know anything about the Tatsunoko side, so I'm going to just assume this is good. But on the Capcom side, we actually have an incredibly interesting roster. It's not full of just Street Fighter characters. No, like Mega Man's here, Roll's here. There's obviously some Street Fighter characters, but like Rival Schools gets an appearance. Dead Rising's here, Onimusha, Darkstalkers, Lost Planet, even Beautiful Joe is here. I think outside of the omission of Ken, the roster is pretty good on the Capcom side. Now when it comes to the fighting, it's not the furthest from say MVC. The game uses a team format, so you know, teams of two, and you can switch mid-fight. The person who switches in is going to be coming in with an attack, and the person on reserve will regenerate health, and the match ends when both characters are defeated. There are also two giant characters that cannot be part of a team. That's the Lost Planet robot and this giant refrigerator. I, I don't know. And when it comes to the controls and feel, it's pretty similar to MBC. You know, there's three attack buttons, there's a bunch of special moves you can do, there's hyper combos, there's air combos, there's team hyper combos. Like, yeah, it's a pretty fast and frantic, crazy fighting game that still feels really nice to pick up and play now, especially if you've ever played MBC. You'll be right at home here. It's not hard to understand. Does this game have seemingly infinite depth and strategy? No, it probably doesn't. Does it feel a bit unbalanced at times? Yeah, it probably is unbalanced. I'm not pro enough to tell you that, but the most important thing is it's flashy, it's satisfying, it's easy to understand. It's a bit harder to master, but it's also just a ton of fun. Like, this game, I've had fun with it for over a decade now. Like, when has this game not been fun? It's just actually a really good time, you know? It's just easy to just grab a controller. This game has many control types you can actually use. You can use GameCube Classic or the Wii Remote and just go at it. It's not too complex to understand, and you're not going to find people really scratching their head trying to figure out how to do anything in this game. None of the combos or the special moves are all that hard to pull off. There's even like simplified controls where it's somehow even easier. I've never messed around with this. I couldn't tell you what it is. I don't even like the modern really in Street Fighter 6 all that much, so this is probably even worse. Now when it comes to modes, like you have all this fighting and these characters, what modes are there? There's the arcade mode, which is pretty standard. You know, you fight the final boss, which is Yami from Okami, which is just, that's random. There's time attack and survival modes. There's actually some mini games thrown in here, and these mini games, you know, they're nothing special, but it's just nice that they're here, and of course then you have the multiplayer. Something this game really sold itself on was its online multiplayer. It actually went online, and it was actually good. 
It's kind of crazy to think nowadays, but yeah, there was a Wii game with good online multiplayer. It was Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. It was absolutely solid, and I know that people are finding ways to play it online even to this day. And while talking about to this day, yeah, even to this day, there is still a community around this game. There's still a bunch of people that do love this game, and that's gotta say something. You know, when I went to EVO a couple years ago, I saw a bunch of people still playing, and I was like, really? Wow. Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, it absolutely lives on. It's still got a fan base. The game still looks really good. It still feels nice. It doesn't feel super archaic or something. I don't expect this one to get a re-release like ever just because of the licensing. But I mean, we can dream, right? We can always dream. But Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, I don't know how pricey it's getting these days since it actually is kind of a cult favorite on the Wii. But you can always just boot up Dolphin and play it on there, which might be how most people play it nowadays. It's still a really fun time, and I absolutely think it is worth trying. And here we have one of the fan favorites, Power Stone, releasing for the Dreamcast in 99. Now, Power Stone is one of the more unique, different fighting games that Capcom has ever made, but it's also one of their most memorable. So the game takes place in the 19th century and sees a bunch of people heading out for fame, glory, fortune, and the legendary Power Stone. Yeah, the, the setup for this game isn't anything special. It did actually get an anime series that fleshes things out a lot more, but this game, yeah, it doesn't really go all that deep with its story. But it does have a number of characters here. There are 10 characters here, and they're all decently different from each other. At least they all look rather different from each other. They don't play crazy different from each other, but yeah, there's 10 characters. And what are you doing with these 10 characters? You're brawling. I mean, what else are they going to do? Have tea? No, they're all fighting each other. And so the gameplay involves two characters being dropped into this three-dimensional area. And yeah, you just beat the crap out of each other. There's regular moves. There's some special attacks. You can actually pick up tables, chairs, rocks. You can pick up really any of the items and throw them and attack people with them. You can even just jump around if you want. During the battle, power stones resembling gems of different colors appear in the arena. If a character collects three power stones, they transform into a more powerful version of themselves where you can actually use these super attacks. You can get these gems knocked out of you though, so you gotta be careful and you know, be a little strategic here. The gameplay is fast, it's frantic, it's chaotic, and it's just kind of all over the place. Does it have a ton of depth or mechanics? No, it absolutely does not. It's very button mashy. There's some basic combos here and there. And the tiniest of strategy if you want to like throw a table at someone or go collect a gem but really it's just this chaotic mess of you just kind of scrambling together to just beat your opponent before they can beat you getting these gems throwing shit at each other just beating each other up like it's it's really fun actually it's very mindless i won't lie it, it doesn't have the depth that really a lot of these other 3d fighting games have but it doesn't need it it's just a really great time like, this is one of the most joyous experiences you can have on the Dreamcast, just getting with a buddy and just beating the shit out of each other for like an hour. Like, not every match is going to go exactly the same because of the factors where the gems land, who uses them, who throws tables, etc, etc. And on top of that, the game looks great, it runs really well, it has a cool soundtrack, like, it just feels really nice. It has a very good feel to it. The controls are generally pretty good. I mean, it's easy to just pick up and play the game. Like, it's not kind of awkward like some of Capcom's other arena fighters like the Spawn game. No, this one you'll get the hang of right away. And so with that in mind, I got no problem recommending Power Stone. It just makes you wonder, how could they make Power Stone even better? Well, just a year later, we'd get Power Stone 2 for the Dreamcast. And Power Stone 2 really looks at the first game and just says, let's just make it bigger, better, and even crazier to create what I believe is not only one of Capcom's best fighting games, but one of the best arena fighters ever, and the best 3D fighting game Capcom has just ever made. The premise is basically the same as the previous game, and when it comes to the characters, yeah, like all the characters from the first game are here, there's a couple more introduced, and they're all different looking at least. And you know, from a presentation standpoint, the game looks very similar to the first game. It doesn't really look much better. The first game looked good. This game just looks a little better. And music-wise, it's similar enough to the first game. It's, it's pretty alright. See, all that's well and good. You know, it's a minor improvement. Where this game, though, absolutely improves is the gameplay and the multiplayer. That is where Power Stone 2 really kicks some ass. See, the first Power Stone had two characters brawling it out in these 3D environments, and that's really what it was. Power Stone 2 ups the ante to four players at a time and makes the stages much, much more engaging. In the first game, they were nothing more than backdrops, and they had some stuff you could pick up and throw each other. Here, though, no, the stages are all very interactive. The stage chosen actually really does matter. You can interact with the majority in the environment, and most of the stages are dynamic and will change as the battle progresses. For example, the airplane stage starts out on a warplane, but after a certain amount of time, the plane actually falls apart, 
forcing all the players to battle while skydiving towards the ground, and then you'll fall onto a floating platform where the rest of the battle will be held. Like all the stages are like this, there's just a lot going on here and it makes it a lot more exciting. Something new is that the stages are also littered with item boxes which hold random items that a player can use. And these items are all incredibly diverse, damaging items from like guns, flamethrowers, hammers, and then a bunch of melee weapons like swords, bear traps, there's roller blades, even a magazine can be thrown. Sometimes they're more passive items like shields or food or elixir for invisibility, sprays that allow you to slow your opponents down, and wings to do even more jumps. And of course the power stones can show up in these. If you collect three of the power stones and hang on to them, you can do some serious damage, but you can still have them knocked out of you. Another difference between the first and second game is there's not as many combos and the blocking is actually gone. Instead what you can do is dodge. And all of this comes together to create one of the most chaotic, frantic multiplayer experiences I've ever had with a video game. Like, Power Stone 2 just goes absolutely nuts and I love it. Like, it is beyond chaotic, it is a frenzy. And the game is never not putting the pedal to the metal, gas all the way, no tires, just gas. Like, the game absolutely goes nuts. And I really just can't help but not love it. Like, this game is so much fun, especially in multiplayer, but even in the single player side, it's super fun also. It makes you wonder, why didn't they just have four players to begin with? Like, it just seems like such a no-brainer to have four players. Like, this just gets really chaotic. I like the addition of all the items, the power stones are still great, the combat, it feels nice enough, it's easy to pick up and play, the controls are nice, it's smooth. No, there isn't the most depth, there isn't the most strategy, and it can sometimes be just too chaotic for its own good and feel almost like 4 8 player smash, but oh man is it such a good time. Like I've said I've had a lot of fun with a lot of these games to be fair, but Power Stone 2, oh, I have had just so much fun with this one. Like Power Stone 2 is one of the most fun multiplayer experiences, just period. Like. The game just goes so hard. Not only does it hit different, but it just goes so hard. And you know, when you hard, you hard. Like, absolutely. The game even has a couple different modes. You know, there's like the one-on-one -on -one where it's like the original game. There's the arcade mode where it's like a four-character storyline game with two characters advancing each round. There's like the multiplayer. And then there's like this adventure mode, which is just this interesting twist on the arcade mode with like items and yeah it's actually just different it's interesting there's bosses and you know it's kind of shocking there's actually a bit of content in the capcom fighting game in the late 90s usually we just had arcade mode and multiplayer but there's actually some other modes here and all of this leads me to say that power stone 2 is a must play if you like capcom if you like fighting games and have the means to play this game especially with friends like it really is must play there's just not any other games really like it and I think that it desperately, desperately needs a re-release with online play. I think this game would go so hard and so many people would be like, wow, this game is just a total blast. Like, I don't hear a ton of people talking about Power Stone anymore, and it's a shame because it really is a great time. The game was re-released on the PSP with the first one as the Power Stone Collection. I've actually never tried this version. I've always played on Dreamcast and recommend the Dreamcast version. But man, oh man, Power Stone 2. I really hope maybe one day Power Stone comes back or gets that re-release because it absolutely deserves it and even all these years later it still feels incredibly unique. Outside of like the Billy and Mandy game, I feel like no games have even tried this style of fighting. All the more reason for me to say just go play it. And so here we have Street Fighter 2 initially releasing in 91 but has since had many 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 re-releases and updates. For this video I am playing the latest version on the Nintendo Switch which is Ultra Street Fighter 2 The Final Challengers, but I have tried a bunch of other versions of Street Fighter 2 thanks to the Anniversary Collection. And you know, before you start disagreeing with me which version I should be playing of SF2, we can all agree this. It doesn't really matter what version of SF2 you're playing, they're all way better than the original Street Fighter. Street Fighter 2 is a huge improvement on the original Street Fighter, importantly in its controls. It's controls, it's cast of characters, how you play through the game, it's balancing, it's speed. Really just everything has been improved on the original Street Fighter to just completely make the original game obsolete. When it comes to the game's premise, you know, it's not all that different from the original Street Fighter and it's kind of generic honestly for a fighting game, but Street Fighter kind of established this generic trend for fighting games where it's really just about a fighting tournament. It's set up by M. Bison, really the series antagonist, and he really just wants to find the best fighter to brainwash them and have them work for him. And whichever character you choose doesn't really agree with that, and they end up kicking the crap out of Bison also. 
And speaking of characters, we have a lot more to play as than just Ryu and Ken. There's E Honda, there's Blanca, there's Guile, there's Chun Li, there's Zangief, Dalsim, Balrog, Vega, Sagat, and of course Bison himself. That's just the original cast. The later versions would add a bunch more characters like T Hawk, Fei Long, DJ, Kami. And the new Switch version even adds Evil Ryu and Violent Ken, which is just a meme at this point. But yeah, character roster is just legendary. It's awesome. All the characters feel very different from each other. And the way that a lot of these characters play really was established all the way back here. Of course, there's been some tweaks for some of the characters, but it's kind of crazy to see how many of the characters really still play almost the same all these years later. The controls, like I mentioned, so much better than the first game. Not stiff as shit. It's actually easy to pick up and play and understand. Hard to master or all that yada yada but you can pick this game up in modern day and still have a great time with it and you won't be complaining oh this feels so outdated this is so clunky this is horrible to play of course you know there's going to be some age with it but i still think it's more than playable nowadays and if you're picking it up these days you're probably playing with a buddy street fighter 2 really sold the idea of beating the crap out of your friend and them doing the same to you in the multiplayer you know street fighter 2 multiplayer what's there really to add at this point to the conversation it's legendary for a reason there's a reason this game has been re-released as many times as it has. It's because it's so beloved. It's such a great fighting game. You could still pick it up, do some combos, beat some ass, and have a great time. If you haven't played Street Fighter 2 at this point, I really think it is one of those games probably everyone should try at some point. I mean, there's so many versions of it too. Like, you really got no excuse for not trying Street Fighter 2 at least once. And so here we have Vampire Savior, also known as Darkstalkers 3, and I believe this is not only the best Darkstalkers game, but one of the best fighting games Capcom has ever actually put out. It does have a different story from the other Darkstalkers games, and it centers around this demonic nobleman named Jetta, who creates this pocket dimension where he tries to bring in souls to help him nourish his new world. And you know, as luck would have it, a number of the souls that show up are characters from the first two Darkstalkers games, along with a few newcomers. I actually really like the setting of this game and I think that it goes for an even cooler aesthetic and vibe than the first two games if that's possible. Now when it comes to the the cast of characters, it has everyone from the original Darkstalkers, however, it omits Donovan, Hutzel, and Pyron from the lineup. Instead, we have four new characters. We have Jetta, Lilith, QB, and BB Hood. All have become iconic characters to the series and really Capcom fighting games in general. While I'm sad to see my man Donovan not come back, you know, these four new characters are pretty great. Jetta's cool, QB's good, Lilith is pretty similar to Morgan, but still cool, and then there's of course BB Hood, which is great. Alright, good character roster aside, we have the gameplay, which is different in a number of aspects when compared to, you know, the previous two Darkstalkers games. The first is that it actually drops the whole traditional round-based system in favor of the damage gauge system, which is actually really similar to Killer Instinct, where instead of having two rounds, each fighter has two life bars and corresponding life markers. So if one character's life gauge runs out, the characters will reset their position, but the other character doesn't get all their health back, it just continues on from how it was going to begin with. And when you are attacked in this game, a small portion of your life will actually be displayed in white, which can be recovered if you don't take any more damage. This game also introduces the Dark Force system, which uses a bar or super meter to allow players to perform special abilities unique to each character for a limited period of time. This adds even more strategy to the special meter and just all your special moves in general. And I think there's just a lot more depth and strategy to this game than any of the other Darkstalkers games. This game is crazy fast. You can actually control the speed and you can make this game go like, you know, at a decent rate. Or you can make it go incredibly fast. But this game flows a lot better than the other Darkstalkers games. In fact, the flow and the pacing are actually really good in this game. It feels really nice. It controls really nice. It's really smooth and responsive. One of the best of any Capcom game. And I was having an absolute blast just beating the shit out of my friends with my favorite monsters. I think the roster is really fun to play as. I think some of the characters have been tweaked a little bit for the better it seems. And there's just so many great characters here and it just feels so nice to pull off combos, chains, supers, etc. And then on top of this, the game looks amazing, it has a great aesthetic, it's really got some nice vibes. And then the music, oh the music's great also. Now, over the years, Vampire Savior actually got a couple updates as well. There was Vampire Hunter 2, which I briefly mentioned, but there's also Vampire Savior 2. And despite it having two in the name, this is really, again, just another situation of Capcom just updating that original game, adding some changes, and 
Just like Vampire Hunter 2, Vampire Savior 2 is considered an inferior version to the original Vampire Savior. You know what community does exist for this game, which isn't the largest, but it is dedicated. They're playing Vampire Savior 1. They're not playing this newer version. People don't like a lot of the changes. Again, there's probably videos that go really into the nitty gritty as to why Vampire Savior 2 is not as good as the first one. There's some character changes. There's some tweaks with the movement, like you can just do infinite grabs. They removed air chains. There's a a bunch of reasons why Vampire Savior 2 is not as good as the first Vampire Savior and I don't think that version's worth playing. Play the original Vampire Savior, it's on the Capcom Fighting Collection. This game is great. I actually had a lot of fun playing this one with the boys, more so than any of the other Vampire games. The game has actually aged really well and I'm really surprised that there hasn't been some kind of modern HD remake re-release of this game in the sense that, you know, Street Fighter 2's gotten so many. I mean, there's even that one on the Switch back when it came out. Why hasn't Vampire Saviors gotten some huge massive overhaul? There's been some re-releases over the years, but I'm talking like a full-on overhaul. I'd love to see it because this game is just a blast and I have no problem recommending it to anybody who likes fighting games. And here we have Street Fighter Alpha 3 releasing originally in 98. Now with Alpha 3 it's pretty easy to assume this but it's true. The game is a follow up and an improvement on Street Fighter Alpha 2. The roster is a pretty decent improvement on Alpha 2, like it really is one of the best rosters the Street Fighter series has ever seen. Not only does it have like everybody from Alpha 2, but it has a bunch of the fan favorites and some new characters here that would go on to continue to be fan favorites. Like, it's just a great roster, then depending on the version, there might be even more characters, with the PSP version having 39, yes, 39 characters. But I mean, all of this wouldn't matter if the fighting wasn't very good, but I mean, it's this high on the list, so it's pretty obvious that the fighting is pretty solid in this game. So Street Fighter Alpha 3 has this totally new system with playing styles known as isms. There are three isms to choose from, and each one of these is actually incredibly different from the last, not only changing the controls, but just kind of how the fighting is in general. There is a ism which is based on the previous alpha games in which the player has a three level super combo with access to several super combo moves but then there's x ism which is a simple style based on super street fighter 2 turbo and with this style the player only has a single super combo gauge and access to a single but very powerful super combo move then the third style v ism is a unique style that allows the player to perform custom combos similar to street fighter alpha 2 but you actually cannot use super combos and then there's actually just a bunch of other variables or across the three isms that make them all incredibly different and all three modes have variations of movesets for each character adding just nothing but a ton of depth like this game just has an ass load of depth this is one of the most in-depth fighting games just of them all like this large of a roster with three play styles each like it doesn't take a genius to figure out yeah there's a lot of depth and there's a lot of strategy going on here and on top of all of this, the game also introduces a guard power gauge, which depletes over time of the player blocks a lot, and you know, eventually the guard can be broken here. Really what I'm just trying to say is that Street Fighter Alpha 3 goes so hard with its depth. Like, it's one of the most in-depth fighting games ever made, not even close. It's like up there with Third Strike, and so much of it just flies over my head. Like, I tried to understand some of it, but at a certain point I was like, man, this shit is complicated. The thing is though is I don't think it's so complicated that you can't understand it. A normal player can still pick this game up and have some fun. You might have to mess around with the isms for a little bit to figure out which one suits your playstyle, but I generally think that you'll be able to figure it out. Especially if you're really familiar with Street Fighter at all. If you're familiar with like the history of Street Fighter and how some of these characters have played in the past, I think you're really going to enjoy this as there's a lot of callbacks and throwbacks and the game kind of feels almost like a love letter to like all of Street Fighter and this was like in the late 90s too before like everyone started idolizing how great fighting games used to be. So while yes, the game can be a little stiff, it can take some time to get used to and there's a considerable amount of depth, the game is still a ton of fun, the game has a great roster of characters, it looks and sounds amazing, the sprite work is superb. It was a big step up from Alpha 2 and Street Fighter 2 and it's one of the best Street Fighter games and it has its own unique gimmick, no other Street Fighter game has this really. And so it has a unique identity even all these years later. And if you have not tried it and you claim to like Street Fighter, well, <laughs> I think it really is worth trying. I think you're rather inclined to like it. I was rather inclined to like it too. I'm not even going to try to pretend to understand a lot of this game's mechanics and depth like past a surface level. And I can still really appreciate what this game is trying to do and just how good of a time it is. It also is hard as fuck in the arcade mode. 
But there's also a reason so many people are still playing Alpha 3, because the depth is low-key endless with so many characters and possibilities and capabilities. Like, yeah, it's a really good time, and anybody that likes fighting games, casual, competitive, doesn't really matter. I think you're going to enjoy the game, and I, I think it's worth trying. And here we have the fan favorite Capcom vs SNK2 releasing initially in 2001. So this game asks the question, how do we make Capcom vs SNK better? How do we give it that Marvel vs Capcom 2 treatment? Oh, they absolutely did here. Capcom vs SNK2 pretty much destroys the original. And in my opinion, it's easily the best game in the whole Capcom vs SNK or SNK vs Capcom series. Really, it's just the best crossover that SNK has had with anything. So when it comes to this game's story or setup or premise or whatever you want to call it, it's really the same as the last one. There's just another big tournament, so a bunch of characters show up. When it comes to the character roster, it features a total of 48 characters. The entire roster from the original game does return here. And there's some new faces that aren't just Street Fighter and King of Fighters. Rival Schools gets an appearance here, and Rock Howard, who for some reason wasn't in the first one, is here now. I think the roster's pretty solid. It's quite a bit better than the first games just because there's even a little more variety and is probably one of the best crossover rosters of seriously like any game. It's actually really solid when it comes to that roster. And when it comes to the gameplay, it has changed quite a bit from the original game in a number of aspects to be a much better fighting game. When it comes to the feel, it actually does feel quite different from the original and it kind of threw me off at first. I was like, whoa, this doesn't play like the original. This actually feels quite different. So instead of it being four buttons, it's now six buttons, more like regular Street Fighter which can feel kind of weird for the SNK characters, especially like the Fatal Fury characters, where I've been playing the same way with these characters for ages, and now they have six buttons to accommodate for, which, you know what, honestly though, it works. It, it really does work, and I think six buttons was the way to go here. The ratio system returns, and it's much better than the original games. In contrast to the fixed system of the original, players can really just select any character they want and assign each one of them a number between 1 to 4, determining their relative strength, adding up to a maximum team ratio of 4. Teams can also consist of a maximum of 3 characters instead of the 4 from the first game, and as usual, having more characters does not mean it's going to be better. Hopefully what I just said makes some sense. Basically, it's different from the first game, and the same can be said for the Groove system, which has four new systems of play based on various Capcom and SNK fighting games. It might make you think, with all these changes and all these tweaks and additions, is the game even still as fun as the original? Oh, it's so much more fun than the original. Not only does it feel way better, but there's more options, there's more combos, there's more characters, there's more, 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 more. There's certainly a lot more depth here. While there is some casual fun that you can have, you can pick it up and play it and have a little bit of fun, it leans a lot more on the more strategic, stiff side of, say, SNK games, where you might need to practice, you might need to lab if you want to pull off some really cool shit like in Marvel vs. Capcom or anything like that, because the game is just, it's a bit difficult in that sense. I still think though it does strike a decent balance between it having that casual fun and the competitive play. I know there are plenty of people still playing this game competitively and seriously nowadays. There is a community and that's because, yeah, it's actually pretty good. The music in this game is more than pretty good though. The music, oh I could go on and on about the music of this game, it absolutely slaps. It is fantastic. The game looks great too, like the sprites are awesome, everything is super smooth, it animates really well, the presentation is just top notch for a fighting game. I will say though when it comes to the modes there isn't exactly a ton here and that's because the game kinda actually relied on its online play. It was actually the first game ever to support cross-platform play between two competing game consoles which is just crazy to think about, like that's, that's ridiculous. And I've never tried any online play, I've always just kind of had some fun with this game on like the GameCube, that's the version I always played, which is just really weird to play with the GameCube controller, but this game has just never not been a blast, it has an excellent roster, it has a lot of depth, and it's just a really all around great fighting game that I have no problem recommending to fans of Capcom fans of SNK, if you just like fighting games in general, I think you're gonna like something. It's got a little something from everyone. I think most people can enjoy something about this game, and I think it is worth trying at the very least. And so here we have Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, releasing originally in 99, but has had several re-releases since then. So like the title implies, this is the third version of Street Fighter 3. I think most people, hopefully most people can agree that the best version of Street Fighter 3, really the only version of Street Fighter 3 you need to play, is Third Strike, which is why I'm counting that as the Street Fighter 3 game. Now Street Fighter 3 had a ton of new characters, in fact almost all of the characters were new, and then the same goes for Second Impact. Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, it has a couple returning characters 
characters, but it's still mostly new to create a pretty awesome roster that's very unique from all the other Street Fighter games. And some of these characters are just weird, like Q and 12, like when are we going to get some actual names for some characters? Anyway, just stupid joke aside, we've got a pretty good roster here of characters that's again really unique and strange for Street Fighter. Now when it comes to the actual gameplay, Third Strike has been heralded as really the most technical Street Fighter game of them all, and it, it's the most technical Street Fighter. The fighting mechanics are some of the deepest fighting mechanics you will find in any video game and it's crazy how long ago this game came out and it's still this deep and not only is it this deep, it's been kind of unmatched especially with the parry system and the guard parries and then the character roster and just knowing all the matchups and all. No, third strike is pretty much unparalleled when it comes to how deep the fighting is. And you know from a professional perspective, yeah this is probably like the best Street Fighter thanks to how deep it is and just how involved the gameplay is and how much mind games go on here. But I'm looking at this from a casual perspective and I gotta say you know, Third Strike it's a blast, there's a lot of great stuff to it, but this game, it can be a bit hard to pick up and play, especially compared to the other Street Fighter games. Like it can be rather intimidating actually because there's so much going on and there's so much to learn and master. and. It takes a lot of practice to get even half decent at this game, way more than the other Street Fighter games. And, you know, again, I'm just a casual player. I'm sure a bunch of hardcores will come in the comments and tell me Third Strike's the best. You don't know what you're talking about. But from a casual perspective, it's a bit isolating. It's a bit hard to get into this game if you haven't been playing it a ton. And playing it with people who have been playing it even a little bit, you're just going to get your ass whooped. Like, don't get me wrong, if you play this game enough, you obviously are going to get pretty decent at it, you'll understand its mechanics, and it becomes incredibly satisfying. Even just pulling off, like, one parry correctly, or one guard parry correctly, is satisfying, let alone being able to block someone special or something crazy like that. And yeah, I have had a number of good matches and good times with this game, but... It certainly felt like there was a hurdle to overcome to just even understanding this game's mechanics and, you know, it's a 90s fighting game. It doesn't exactly do a great job explaining all of that to you. See, what doesn't need an explanation, though, is this game's presentation. This game looks amazing. Like, it is aged amazingly, and it's one of the best sprite-based video games I've ever seen presentation-wise. Like, it is absolutely fantastic. The animation, the characters, the stages, it is all superb here. The music, oh, it's so good, too. The music is really good in this game. I love the music of Third Strike. The presentation is just gold. It's gold in this game. All in all, when it comes to Third Strike, I think it is worth trying, especially if you've played other Street Fighter games but I would not recommend this as a first game, absolutely not. I think you should play at least a couple Street Fighter games before you try Third Strike, thanks to, again, its depth, its mechanic, and just how hard it can be to get into this game. But if you really do get into this game, I can assure you it is one of the most rewarding experiences you'll have with any fighting game, and that's why, again, I have no problem recommending it, just not as your first Street Fighter. And that music, man, that jazz, that funk, oh, the music, I could go all day about the music, is so good in this game, but this game, really great time. And so here we have Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Now this is the re-release of MVC3, and you know, I remember when MVC3 came out, it was was huge people were going nuts they were like holy shit Marvel vs Capcom is back and most people liked it this ultimate version though is easily the definitive way to play the game nowadays and in my opinion it's not only one of the best fighting games ever made by Capcom but it really is one of the best fighting games ever made it's like they took Marvel vs Capcom 2 and kind of put it on crack the game plays incredibly similar to MVC2. It was crazy how there might have been like a 10 plus year difference, but you could totally pick this game up and it felt like you were playing MVC2 again, except it does play a lot faster. It is a little smoother. It's still got the three on three and you can still summon your friends to do an assist and they can still get their ass whooped when they come in. So always be careful. The hyper combo gauge returns and it's these awesome special moves. You can have the whole team jump in to do these awesome special moves. And then there's actually some cool other moves here like the snapbacks, which forces the current opponent off screen and replaces them with another teammate. And then the game also has a new mechanic known as the X Factor, which offers increased damage, speed, health regeneration for a short amount of time. It can only be activated once per match, and it can be used to extend combos. I'm not the biggest fan of the X Factor, but I think it's a decent little addition that mixes things up. So while the game does feel very similar to MVC2 and is just as crazy, it is worth noting the control scheme is a little different. Rather than the four buttons from before, it is now light, medium, heavy. But to be honest, this isn't the biggest change. It doesn't really change how a lot of the characters play or feel, it just is a little different. 
at least from my casual ass perspective. I don't know, from a competitive standpoint, it might be totally different. And yeah, while talking casual, competitive, all of that, this game, it still totally has a competitive scene. There's still a decent amount of people playing it. It still has a little community, and there's still people casually playing it. There's even people online nowadays. I'm not going to say there's a bunch of people online, but there are still people online to my understanding, which is pretty impressive for a game of this age. Now, something I haven't brought up yet is the characters, and that's because the characters in this game, oh, it's good. It's really good when it comes to the character roster. This game takes big, fat, dookie shits all over MVC Infinite to create maybe the best roster for any Marvel vs. Capcom game, or really just any fighting game in general outside of Smash and MVC 2. Like, it really is a dream roster that I look at now and I'm like, I don't know if a roster could be this awesome nowadays with Marvel characters. Like, both sides are just fantastic. The Marvel side has so many great Marvel characters. A bunch of the fan favorites and classics are here that you'd expect, you know, Wolverine, Spider-Man, Captain America, Iron Man, etc. But this game has a bunch of newer, more popular Marvel characters like Deadpool, like Doctor Strange, like Ghost Rider, like Iron Fist, like Rocket Raccoon. Shit, even She-Hulk's here. Even X-23 is here also. Like, the Marvel side, it's great. The Capcom side, there is so much fan service here. You know, there's a plenty of Street Fighter characters. Of course, there's gonna be the Street Fighter characters, but... But there's actually a bunch of other Capcom games represented here. There's Resident Evil characters, there's Devil May Cry characters, Amaterasu from Okami, Beautiful Joe... Strider's back, Phoenix Wright is even here, Nemesis of all characters from Resident Evil is here... Yeah, the roster really is just excellent. Outside of the missing Ken, I don't know why he's not here. The roster, though, kicks some serious ass. This game is just fantastic. It is so much fun. It looks great. It plays great. It sounds great. Like, the presentation, I love the presentation. It looks super cool and has a nice, sleek aesthetic that really puts it in line with Marvel Comics, and I think all the Capcom characters translate well to it. It looks honestly better than Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Like, this game just dunks so hard on that game. Like... Forget that game, this game is awesome. It's more widely available than some of the other games I've talked about here, and I absolutely think it is worth trying. It's just a grand old time. And so here we have Street Fighter 4, initially releasing all the way back in 2008, but has seen many re-releases, just like the rest of the series, with the latest being Ultra Street Fighter 4 in 2014. Now, Street Fighter 4, I... Played a little bit in the mid-2000s when it became Super Street Fighter 4, but I really got more into it in the early 2010s, and then eventually when Ultra came out, that's what I played quite a bit of. Now, Street Fighter 4, I know some people might groan seeing it this high on the list, but I love Street Fighter 4. So this game does have a story, I, I think. It takes place after Street Fighter 2, but before 5, and sees Bison surviving and having another Street Fighter tournament, and you know what, the story, who really cares too much about the story of Street Fighter 4, it's never been the most involved, you know, every character has their own little story when you play the arcade mode, and these are better than whatever overall arcing narrative that Street Fighter 4 was trying to tell. Anyway, let's talk about the roster here, because the roster in Street Fighter 4, especially Ultra Street Fighter 4, it's the best roster of any Street Fighter game, not even close. And it's one of the reasons this game is so high, because the roster just goes nuts. The roster goes insane, it goes sicko mode, it goes every positive adjective you can think of. It has so many characters. Like, this game has a stupid amount of characters. It has more characters, I'm pretty sure, than any other Street Fighter game. Street Fighter X Tekken has a lot of characters, but in terms of just Street Fighter, yeah, this game has the most characters of any of the games. Like, all the fan favorites are here, except my man Q, R.I.P. Q, he, his, his days are done, it seems. But no, seriously, there are so many characters here, so many good characters, so many classic characters, a ton of new characters that have become iconic. Like, characters, characters, characters. That's really what I can say about Ultra Street Fighter 4. It's probably the biggest positive because there's just such a wide range of characters. But anyway, let's talk the fighting. The gameplay is a lot more like Street Fighter 2 than anything Street Fighter 3 was doing. This game does not have the depth or technical prowess, I guess, that Street Fighter 3 Third Strike had with all of its parries and all of that stuff. There's a few things carried over, like the grabs, but it plays a lot more like Street Fighter 2, and the game is a lot more casual, and I'm sure some people didn't really care that, yeah, the gameplay and the fighting mechanics are a bit simplified and dumbed down compared to Third Strike, but in all fairness, you can pick up the game and have fun with it. Anyone can pick up the game pretty much and have fun with it versus Third Strike. 
which certainly could have been a bit more alienating. I like that you can actually just pick up Street Fighter 4 and have fun no matter what your skill level is. Obviously though, there is a ton of depth here. It's a Street Fighter game and I mean there's been pro tournaments forever for this game be for a reason. It's because the fighting is good, it's satisfying, it's got a good flow to it. it the game still does have a decent amount of depth. It just really nothing touches third strike in terms of the depth but the game is still incredibly fun this game's main gimmick i guess was the focus attacks which is this move that allows the player to absorb an attack and basically launch a counter attack it's this big slow attack and you know from a casual perspective it might not seem all that great but i've seen some real technical stuff done in the professional setting with this one so i'm not going to totally discount it I think it's fine, I don't think it disrupts the gameplay or changes Street Fighter's core gameplay. The game still, again, plays pretty similar to Street Fighter 2, and I think it's a decent addition. I feel like that might be a hot take, but I'm pretty sure everyone can disagree on something with Street Fighter. But what I think most people won't disagree on is that the presentation is pretty solid in this game. I know there's a lot of people who prefer the sprite-based look of like Third Strike, and don't get me wrong, the sprite work is amazing in that game, but I really like the style and aesthetic of Street Fighter 4. It feels like 2 really brought to 3D. I like how it looks, I think the music's pretty great, and... I'm really just picking up what this game's putting down. You know, I've really loved Street Fighter 4 for a long time and will continue to love it. It's just a really great game and it's one of my favorite fighting games probably of all time and I have zero problem recommending it. Even if you haven't played a Street Fighter game, this is a great entry point. You can start with Street Fighter 4. Just an all around great time. And I'm shocked that it's not like my top Street Fighter game. But here we have the recently released Street Fighter 6 and all I gotta say is damn. Like maybe it's just my recency bias coming through but hot damn Street Fighter Fighter 6. This game really just firing off on all cylinders out here. Now obviously I'm going to preface, you know, we don't know the longevity of this game, we don't know how it's going to look in a couple of years, and so it could change, and I don't know, they could totally mess something up, but you know, from this original release already of Street Fighter 6, it, it's just fantastic. It is just absolutely fantastic. Street Fighter 6 is like the most complete Street Fighter release like ever and this is the initial release not like the 10th release of the game like I am just like holy crap this game is just amazing right off the bat. It feels like they just got everything absolutely right, like on the first try too, with a really robust in-depth story mode that actually has a lot of length to it with an awesome online hub and battle system and then it has all the staples that single player street fighter games would have you know like the arcade the practice the training the challenges all of that like and the fighting mechanics are not only really user friendly probably the most user friendly of any street fighter game but it seems like there's still a ton of depth here that you know i mean i don't know if i'd say it rivals third strike but it's certainly up there it's definitely more in depth than five and four now I think the best place to start when talking about Street Fighter is the fighting. The fighting is just fantastic in this game. Not only does it feel incredible and it feels amazing, it's really smooth, it's satisfying, and it's just great to control. One of the best controlling fighting games I've ever seen. And with the controls, they actually have two control schemes here. You know, you've got your classic Street Fighter controls where it's the six button layout, but they actually have a simplified four button version that's called Modern Controls. And you know, at first I was a bit like, uh, is this like the easy mode of from Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite? But no, this is actually legit. This is actually a legit way to play and it doesn't cripple you. It doesn't make you stupid OP. You're not going to get owned by somebody who's on classic controls. I mean, that might happen anyway, but I think modern is actually a very viable option here. And it's great for people who haven't played a ton of Street Fighter or aren't super familiar with fighting games. In fact, this is like the most inviting fighting game I've ever played where it's like you got no skill here. Try this game because it will make you a fan. And I love that. I want as many people to play these fighting games as possible. And this game is just incredibly inviting to the genre. And then there's actually some depth. This game does have some mechanics to it that harken back to third strike like the introduction of the drive gauge you know you've got your super down below but that's this is unrelated actually the drive gauge can basically be seen as your stamina so when you do a parry which yes parries actually return here it uses the drive gauge there's also what is basically a focus attack it uses the drive gauge if you use all of it up then you actually take chip damage while blocking and you can't use any of these moves and i think the drive gauge is a great addition it's a good gimmick for street fighter it doesn't feel out of place it doesn't feel like it's taking over it doesn't feel weird like the v stuff 
and it just adds so much depth to this game. At least it feels like it. We'll see in the long run if it actually does, but I am a huge fan of these systems. I think they're both great, and they're both great mechanics to have here, and it really adds a new layer to Street Fighter that we haven't seen yet. And then we have the characters. I think the character roster, you know, it's actually pretty solid. It's certainly better than fives. In fact, just about everything's better than fives. I think the roster's good. There's a lot of the classics here. There's a couple new ones here, and I like everybody. Everybody plays super different, and I was actually able to pick up a bunch of characters I've never been good at before and use them with the modern control scheme and actually whoop some ass. Characters like Jury. And I gotta say, I felt pretty cool while doing it. But aside from that, I really do like the character roster, and I'm gonna just say the aesthetic, the presentation, the music in this game. Oh, it is so good. I love how this game looks. I love how it sounds. Love the aesthetic. Like, it, it's just fantastic from a presentation standpoint. And then the game actually has a character creator. You get to make your own character. You can make a monstrosity. As you can see, I made a monstrosity. It was just horrifying to look at. But for some reason, I seem to be right at home with the other monstrosities here. Eventually, I did change it because I felt physically ill looking at my character and made something that looks normal. And what do you do with this character? You actually have a whole ass story mode to play through. Finally, we get some real single player content to Street Fighter. More than an hour story mode or the arcade mode, which the arcade mode is here and arcade mode is cool and all and training's great and the challenges are great. But we have a whole ass story mode here. There's like an actual story, which, you know, it's pretty Street Fighter tournament some classic characters, some conflict, I mean it's nothing really special the story is, but this game is so unhinged, like Street Fighter's always been pretty unhinged, but like seeing it in this fully fleshed single player mode, yeah you really see how unhinged it is, and this single player mode is like Yakuza, where there's actually like a whole map to explore, there's like side objectives, there's like main missions, there's collectibles, you can customize your character like I said, there's RPG mechanics where you level up your stats and your skills and learn new moves. You actually get to really customize your character's move sets as you learn new moves from characters like Chun-Li and Ryu Ken. All of the classics are here. And you get into fights with random mooks on the street. The gameplay is much more like a beat-em-up like Final Fight here. And Final Fight is playable in the hub area. But yeah, it's a lot more like Final Fight where you just beat everything up rather than being a traditional fighting game. And it actually really works. I think the single player is actually great in this game. There's a bunch to explore and it's got a really good length to it. It's got well over 10 to 15 hours of gameplay in the single player alone for a fighting game. That's the most of, of like any fighting game. Like maybe like... Mortal Kombat Deception comes kind of close, but that game wasn't very good. This is actually good. Now is the single player gameplay, you know, the story mode, the best gameplay ever? No. I won't lie, it does get pretty repetitive, especially by the end, and there's a ton of annoying ass enemies like the fridge and the drones. These can just fuck right off. I hated fighting these, but I mean, this gameplay, for the most part, is still excellent. It's a great time, and exploring the city was actually really cool, and I'm, like, shocked that they actually put this in the game. I had no idea this was, like, going to be in the game. Maybe I wasn't watching the marketing enough, but I was like, damn, there's a full-ass story mode here. This is cool. But I know there are plenty of people that probably won't even ever try it. And then we have the online and the battle hub. I really like the battle hub system where you can just kind of vibe with your friends in here and mess around with other Street Fighter games and just, again, hang out. It's cool. And then the online battles, they're great. I've never had any issues with the online battles that weren't of my own. Like, my internet shitting out. Thank you, Xfinity. But, like, when it comes to this game's connectivity and stability, when it comes to the online, it's been nothing but fantastic. And I've already had a ton of great matches and a ton of fun with Street Fighter VI, and I expect to have a ton of fun with this game for years. Like, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but this game is just superb, and I have zero problem recommending this game to anybody who likes fighting games, Street Fighter. It's just excellent. And here we finally are, in my opinion, Capcom's greatest fighting game of all time. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes, baby. Oh yeah, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is not only my favorite fighting game from Capcom, but it's like my favorite fighting game of all time that isn't Smash Brothers. Like, I just fucking love Marvel vs. Capcom 2, man. I've been playing this game for so long, and it just never gets fucking old. It's so much fun, man. Marvel vs. Capcom 2, you know, back when it came out, people were raving about it. And then, as I was growing up, a ton of people were talking about how great it still is. And even nowadays, oh, it slaps, it fucks, it gets laid, it, for sure. It's so great. 
it's the fan favorite it's the pinnacle of the mvc series like it doesn't matter what year it is this game just fucking rules whoa whoa, whoa. which game came back to evo many years after it had come out what, what was it again oh marvel vs. capcom 2 because of course it was 56 characters 56 characters this game has like the biggest of any capcom fighting game really the biggest roster of any fighting game that isn't smash brothers or dragon ball like it is just fantastic like all the fan favorites at the time were here like nobody was left out from any of the previous marvel or capcom fighting games they're all here they all look great they play great everyone feels relatively different well as different as ken and ryu can be and then there was a bunch of newcomers here as well, and a lot of these have gone on to be just fan favorites, not only for Capcom games, but just fighting games in general. I don't know if we'd ever get a roster this big for another MVC or really any other Capcom game like ever again because it's just, it's so big, there's so much depth. And then of course this game, it has the teams, so it's teams of three going up against teams of three, whoever defeats everyone first wins. And it really just never gets old playing this game. Like, I have been playing this game for so long now, and it almost always feels fresh. It's always fun, and it always feels like I have a different combination of characters. Like, there's some that I'm clearly better at than others, but it just always feels so fresh. And then the fighting itself, it's peak 90s fighting, man. It's not the most in-depth. It can be a little button masher. You got your four buttons, and you just go at it. There's a bunch of special moves, a bunch of combos. There's obviously the hyper gauge. You can have all three of your characters use their hyper gauge at once. You can summon other characters on your team for a little assist. They can do more damage, but they can also get hit themselves. So, you know, you got to be a little careful here. This game did introduce the snapback, which forces opponents to switch characters. And man, it just feels so good. This game really just does feel so great. Like, it's easy to pick up, it's easy to understand, but it gets hard, and I mean really hard to master. The depth is there, especially for an MVC game. It's probably the most in-depth of them all. And that's no slight on Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. That game has a good amount of depth, too. It's just MVC 2 is it's just unrivaled, man. It's just unrivaled. The arcade mode's great. The multiplayer's fantastic. And, you know, while I did mess around with this game on, like, the Dreamcast and the PS2, especially when I was younger, it was really when the game came to 360 is when I got hella into it and I started playing online. And this is the most I've gotten into almost any fighting game. Like, I actually played a ton of MVC 2 online. It was just so much fun. And I can't believe that we live in an era where MVC2 is not readily available for everyone to play because this game needs to be experienced. This game, it just needs to be experienced. You know, call it my nostalgia, call it me just fantasizing how great the game is, or maybe it hasn't aged all that well, but I disagree. I think the game still holds up. I think it's still a blast, and this game really is like my favorite fighting game of all time with like Smash Bros. Ultimate. Like, it just doesn't get any better than this. Sure, plenty of games nowadays look a lot better than this game, or they might be a bit smoother or easier to pick up and play, but they just don't have the longevity, the depth, or fun that this game has. And that's no slight on this game's look either. Like, the game looks great. I love the look of this game. I think it has a fantastic aesthetic that is aged actually incredibly well, and the sprites are great. And then we have the music. The music, no, 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 no. The music is untouchable in this game. Anybody who tells you the music sucks in this game, man, I don't know, I don't know what you want. This has some of my favorite music from like any video game. It is so good. The character select screen, the music in the fights. Yeah, it's different. It's funky. It's kind of jazz like it's it's very different from what you'd expect from a fighting game. But that's why I love it all the more. Like it's so unique. It's so good. And I just feel like no other Capcom game has the same awesome music as this one. Plenty of other Capcom fighting games have great music, like Capcom vs SNK2, but this game, oh, the music slaps so hard. Everything about this game, I really do love everything about this game, and I wholeheartedly, with zero problems, tell you, go play this game. Find any way you can to play Marvel vs Capcom 2. You will not regret it. This is one of the best games just like ever made free mvc2 there's no reason this it shouldn't be available on modern consoles i have a feeling it's because of the marvel license that's my guess and i hope that one day this changes because it really should be played and that's it for the list you know i'm sure plenty of people have disagreed with me or told me i'm wrong about a 10,000 different things but you know I put the effort in, I played all these games, I tried them all out just to talk to you about all of them. I love fighting games and I really just wanted to see how all of Capcom stacked up and in the end, yeah, MVC2 was my favorite, but that doesn't mean it's your favorite. We can all agree though, Capcom has put out some real bangers, that's for sure.
And so with all that in mind, I need you to comment Hamtaro if you made it to this part of the video, as in like that old anime series, then I'll know you're a real one, I'll know you watched it to the end, man. You rule, I'm gonna give you a heart, man, woman, whoever you are, I don't care, you made it to the end, Hamtaro's the word. And please, if you know anybody, share this with whoever you know, like, subscribe if you haven't already. I got a Patreon, I put a lot of time into this, playing all these games, trying all of them out, recording footage for some of them. And then, of course, talking to you about all of them and then editing. Yeah, this is a long ass process. And I just I hope that even a couple people enjoyed it because it's all worth it. This was a great time. I love Capcom and these fighting games. All right. I'm just rambling here. So I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and uh, like, share, subscribe, all that great stuff. See you all later. Bye bye now.